Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with Tony Buchan. Did I get it right? Uh, nicely pronounced. Okay, very good. Well, I didn't yes. mess it up. No worries. How are you? I'm very well. Yes, just back from a, a very brief uh, trip to Australia. So uh, just getting through that jet lag. I'm um, allowing myself an extra coffee a day, put it that way. Good. And I just had one of your cups of coffee. It was rather delicious. Oh, good. Yes. Well, you know, I do try and, uh, you know, go to the best purveyors of the best, you know, grinds in LA. I've done my research. Lovely. So how long have you been in uh, sunny Los Angeles? I've been here for three years now. So um, I was just saying to you before that, uh, you know, it's not very long, but it's also quite a long time. I'm in that in-between period, you know, depending on who you speak to. They're like, oh, you've been here for a minute or they're like, that's yeah, not very long. You know, so, you know, settling into a new music community, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to move from, you know, one music community to another and then just surround yourself with new people. And it's great for your creative mind kind of explodes, you know, Wonderful. has a bit of a rebirth. So you're in Eagle Rock, which I think is a really nice little musical community here. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few studios I noticed over the last couple of years up and down this actual street, the yep. main street here. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing is, is the houses are beautiful. It's very affordable to live around here. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of artists sort of moved over here in the last four or five years. Absolutely, yeah. I, do you live in this area as well? I do, yeah. I live in Outwater Village, which is close by. I can ride my bike here, which is kind of unheard of in LA. You know, people look at you as a bit of a weirdo as they drive past you that, I don't know what to do with this bike rider, but, uh, <laughs> but I like it. Um, it's a good way to clear the head before coming into the studio. But yeah, Eagle Rock's an interesting uh, neighborhood. It's changed a lot even since I've been here in the last three years, I'd say. Um, the rents are going up for sure, but you put it correctly that, um, you know, a lot of artists live in this neighborhood. There's a lot of studios because the real estate's been cheaper. There's a lot of old industrial buildings that have been converted. This is one of them. Uh, when I moved here three years ago, this was just a shell. Um, and they were building it, so I moved in. I was the first tenant, and um, I knew the guys who were putting this building together. They've got King Size Sound Labs across the street. Oh, nice. It's the same people. Uh, and, uh, you know, like all neighbourhoods in L.A., I mean, you just wouldn't know from the facade. You know, you drive past these buildings, they look kind of nondescript, but behind the doors, I mean, there's great studios, there's wonderful creative stuff going on, you know, the, behind these sort of nondescript buildings. It's interesting because, you know, obviously a one of the many discussions that people have is like the death of the traditional studio. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I feel like the, the classic studios are as busy as ever, like the classic, classic ones, yep. which is a handful of studios in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But then there's this massive culture now of what you have here, yeah. where you need a creative space that you can work at at any time mm -hmm. rather than block booking a week in a studio. Yep. And uh, it's convenience is what wins. It is convenience. It uh, brings pluses and minuses to the process. I mean, you know, I came up absolutely working in bigger studios. Um, although from quite early in my career, I was a musician first. And, you know, being a musician, I was only working on tape and doing all that kind of stuff. Pro Tools was very much in its infancy. Um, Sounds like my story. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, our generation, I mean, you'll hear that story a lot, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're the transitional into. So we have the best of both worlds in a way because we're able to go back to tape if we want to or, you know, just use the analog realm for what it's good for, whatever. Uh, but um, so when, uh, you know, when I started out, I was definitely working in bigger studios, but I put my uh, a studio together very early in the piece because I, I identified that when digital came about, I was like, oh, well, I just need a space where I can go deep. Um, you know, if we don't have a budget to do something, I don't want to necessarily stop creating. Um, so there are pluses and minuses for me, I find, because I've been used to working in big rooms. Um, there's something about working in big rooms that is very special. Mm -hmm. um, I like to call it having air around the sounds. There's a certain air that you get sure. around anything that you're recording in a bigger space, even if it's a guitar amp close mic, to find that when you're in a bigger room, you might put it in that room and there's something that happens. That said, coming in here with all the toys, it's you know like a laboratory, whatever. You go there and you can do deep research. You can go super deep. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, you know, from Joe Meek onward, there, there are examples of these smaller sort of home studios. It's interesting that it's not just a phenomenon, I think, of the 2000s or something, that it was happening even back to the, you know, I mean, the 50s with, you know, um, well, I Les agree. Paul, I mean, right? Yeah. Well, Stax was uh, in an office building. Yeah, exactly. With low ceilings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Everything was wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my favorite jazz record ever, you know, Way Out West was recorded in a uh, warehouse, you know, with vinyl records around it at the record label, you know, just straight into the back of the tape machine with C12s. So it was like, you know, so this, you know, people have been 
finding ways to make music, you know, but... Um, sure. Jack, Jack Douglas told me Aerosmith Records made in houses. Right. Made in... Yeah. Or, or even the opposite, made in a room which is completely carpeted and dead. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I mean? So Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I mean, people have been searching, w whatever, for convenience, but also for sound, but also for that feeling of just feeling comfortable, I think, you know, sure. like outside of a big studio as I'm sure you've heard so many times, uh, you know, you go into these big rooms, they're the most wonderful sounding rooms, but they're often unadorned by gear. You might have Pultex and 1176s in a console and great mics, but in terms of some of the more eclectic things, sure. and what's beautiful actually these days is that, um, you know, I might go in and track basics with a band or go and track drums elsewhere, but I'll get to bring all this stuff. I keep everything in just portable racks intentionally right. so I can bring it in and ev every studio has a producer bay or whatever they call it where they can just you know at least 12 lines you can just plug in and then suddenly I've got my palette in that room and I love doing that. Well I noticed a massive change I'm sure you did as well I'm not sure if, if it's probably exactly the same story in Australia is that I would go into a classic studio mid late 90s yep. and I'd look over and there'd be 12 1176s right not even blink 12 would be pretty standard yeah you know, four or five, one sixties. You know, maybe have some really super eclectic stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe some gates. You know, maybe even a Fairchild. Yeah. But the point was, I'd have more compressors and EQs I could ever imagine. Now I go into those same rooms, two eleven seventy sixes. Right. Maybe one or two one sixties, and the Fairchild's probably gone because, you know, John McBride bought it for Blackbird. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, is like it's weird because now we're going into these rooms purely, as you were saying, for the room, for the actual experience of being in a mm -hmm. large room with a large format console. And yeah. usually still a great mic collection. I will say that whatever Absolutely. studio I get, yeah. the mic collections are still mm -hmm. second to none. Mm -hmm. And that said though, you know, I'd like to make a record with 14 1176s <laughs> because I really like those limitations, you know. It's yeah. like, okay, how can we get creative here? And, you know, 1176s, yeah. obviously you can kind of do anything <laughs> with that thing anyway. Yeah. Push the buttons in and you've got kind of like a splashy you know, crazy thing anyway, and or you can just do the most subtle compress. you know. So those kind of things are kind of exciting. But um, I think I've gone all the way into eclecticism. You know, it's funny, in Sydney, where I'm from, a lot of the studios, the biggest studios, as you mentioned, like a lot of the biggest studios are closed, the more oh, wow. sort of professional, whatever. There's one or two left. But there's other very successful musicians who have had hits worldwide in, say, the 70s or 80s, have built studios which are sort of glorified home studios but have a very eclectic, deep uh, set of gear. So I've been able to benefit from all of those. There was one studio in particular called Electric Avenue owned by a guy called Phil Punch who was my mentor in terms of being an engineer because I never trained as an engineer. But he was such a boffin that he had two of everything. And if you've got two of everything, then you can learn pretty much, you know, you can go deep on, in terms of engineering. So I was very fortunate in Sydney to have that. <clears throat> People might think of, you know, Australia is so far away, a bit of a backwater or something, but there are some magical, magical little pockets there. And Perth, for some reason, has a ridiculous amount of amazing studios. Yeah, for me, I think Australia is being <laughs> a, a pretty amazing hub of rock, to be quite frank. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know and we were talking not just about, obviously, like ACDC and the Bee Gees, you know, British implants that blossomed and became massive in Australia mm, and then mm. exported to the rest of the world. Mm. Those are the obvious ones that we can talk about all day. Yep. But then the last, the rock scene, even for the last 20 years, so many great bands, we talk about Jet, we talk about Wolf Mother, Tame Impala. I mean, all of those bands uh, leave a huge footprint, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't know. I think Australia actually is. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of the countries that gets mentioned. Australia, Absolutely. when Sweden, and you t once you take away the obvious sort of Britain and America, Australia comes up pretty heavily. So look, I'd love to talk a lot talking about setups. I'd like to know about your setup. Mm -hmm. First of all, I suppose I've I looked at your all music. I've seen what you've been doing. I saw like Popwise. You work with Troy Savan. Mm -hmm. um, was that an association before that you that you had long term with him? That was through the label. That one um, through Capital. So. Uh, yeah, well, through EMI in Australia. Oh, okay. So it came yeah. from Australia. Yeah, I mean, he was signed by EMI Australia as a sort of YouTube guy, you know, because he's also an actor and he had a whole YouTube career before he went into... I, I remember, yes. Um, so, uh, so yes, EMI Australia picked him up and there's a lovely a &R guy there that um, it's a real feather in his cap. It's been good because, you know, these global huge things, you know, few and far between these days. So that was yep. a big one, yeah. So that's great. So you got you got the gig because this is only last year, wasn't it? So you got the gig mm -hmm. through Australia, 
Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. A lot of stuff comes through Australia still. I find that when you move territories, yep. um, not just from Australia, but from anywhere, I think your home territory remains important. Great. Yeah, throughout your career, I know people that have been here for 20 years and still are sort of drawing from their home territory. And Australia, um, for me, I certainly wasn't running away from anything because I think the music community there is very healthy. Uh, for many reasons, um, you know, that we could either go into or not, but there's, uh, you know, it's very supported by uh, the public radio station sort of system there, like the NPRs of, you know, of America. We have the ABC, which is like the BBC in the UK, sure. and it's hugely supportive. And I think it's, um, you know, it uh, it fosters a scene there, and then the festival circuit is insane, which feeds all through that the ABC, uh, and that fosters, you know, a huge music community there. So it's a good place to make music and I love it when artists come out and work with me here. I'm, I'm down for it. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, just, you know, before we get into the gear then, just do a little bit of a career path because you said you were a musician. Mm -hmm. So you were playing in bands yep. and then you learned, it sounds like me, you learn how to record out of necessity. That's right. And a love. And obviously. being a control freak. I always <laughs> put that one in there as well because, you know, I, I just was watching, I was one of those guys, the annoying guy in the band on the shoulder. That's me. That's you know, I, I mean, time, we've yeah. all been there, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are certain personalities. What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing? That? Why exactly? Yeah, yeah. But you learn from that, right? I yeah. mean, by asking those questions. And as I said, I was very fortunate to have engineers who are very talented and very knowledgeable that were able to cope with my constant badgering and questioning. Um, but my questions only really came on when I started being a producer. When I was a musician, I was, you know, working just in my band or other bands. I was more happy to just sit on the floor and just be present as a musician. But when I started um, producing, first I started producing my own band's records, and then I started getting hired by other bands who are fans of my band. You know, I think that's a, an organic way that, you know, producers often come into their into their careers if they don't come through the assistant engineer, engineer path, sure. which I didn't. Um, I'm die, so I, I relate. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And um, I still play from time to time. I don't put myself out as a sessionist as such. I think that's Although a Although you mindset. were just saying you were playing with Robin Hitchcock. I am playing with Robin Hitchcock. So, you know, I'll, I'll if something comes across my radar and we connect, I'll absolutely go there because I think that playing live is, is a sort of drug that you get addicted to that never leaves your system. It's good to keep you vital. I go out on the road and play, although whenever I have to shift my headspace from being in the studio to playing live. What instrument are you playing with? with I play bass when I go out and play live. Yeah, that's my main performing instrument, but um, I play a lot of all the things and I do a lot of string arrangements. Who else is in his band these days? Uh, a guy called Luther Russell uh, on uh, guitar, who's a bit of an LA luminary, who's been around for a long, long time. He's an amazing character um, and a producer here as well. He's very old school. I will only do analog, only on tape, and usually only on four track cassette. Actually, he's, <laughs> he's quite the boffin, but he's great. Um, and Mark uh, Shepard was on drums. Who uh, you might know for he's an actor. He's on a show called um, Supernatural. And uh, so he's an interesting one. He used to be a drummer um, back in the day in London in the post-punk scene. He was in t television personalities, which, you know, gives him serious street cred. Um, you know, we're on the road and a lot of, you know, people from Beck's band and wherever else will be coming up to him and just, you know, questioning about that. But he went into acting and was in uh, Name of the Father and, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's done some really... So he came back out. He sort of came back out into playing drums just to come out with Robin because he's a huge Amazing. Robin Hitchcock fan. And before that, I was playing with Tim Finn from uh, oh, Split amazing. Ends Crowded House back in Australia and New Zealand. Amazing. Spent a lot of time in, in New Zealand working there out of um, Neil's studio, his brother's studio in, uh, in Auckland. He's got a studio called Roundhead, which is a magnificent studio. Has the um, Bearsville Neve in there, the one that The Beautiful. Who worked on and um, Todd Rundgren and all that. And that's a wonderful studio. I mean, Neil and Tim, Crowded House, I mean, that's... Uh... Yeah, heavyweights. Yeah. I was the I was the meat in the Finn sandwich sometimes. We did some Finn Brothers shows and I had to sing the harmonies between them. And that's uh that's quite the challenge. I think if if you're not a crowded house fan, go and be a crowded house fan. That's really all I can say. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, masters of masters of the song. Oh, unbelievable. And I remember when they got back together to do Woodface. And mm -hmm. that was just oh my hairs are standing on end, by the way. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a masterpiece, you, yeah. masterpiece, and that, and just that, the masterpiece of just pop songwriting when "It's Only Natural" came out. Yeah, I just remember that came on the radio in England. It was like, mm -hmm. it was unbelievable. Yeah, Mitchell Froome worked on that one. He, oh, did? Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, he's uh, he's worked on most of the Crowded House stuff uh, from that golden period, and he's an amazing, amazing guy. Yeah, 
I, d I don't know Mitchell very well. Mm. Um, but yeah, just incredible band, amazing harmonies. And of course, Split Ends, which wrote, um, you know, that, that, what was the big hit single called? Um, I got, I got you. I got you. Yeah. And it's like this really kind of dark, I got you. And it's all like yeah. super dark. Mm -hmm. And then I get high when. And then this pop chorus comes in. It's just like, wow. Yeah, it's, it's just... insane. All of their stuff is quite dark, actually. And I say that the light it comes more from Neil and the darkness comes from Tim. Um, although Neil would hate me saying that. And if he sees that, he'll kick my ass. But, <laughs> but that's my feeling from it. I feel like Neil has this natural tendency for brighter. Harmonies more yeah. Beatlesque, you know. You, to be honest, I, I if you were to ask me, that's what I would assume. Right. Yeah. Because I have the solo albums, yeah. and that's the sort of yeah. basic analogy. I think a listener and a fan Absolutely. feels like that. Neil's like the happier one, and Tim's the right, dark. But you meet them, and there's equal darkness there. You know, <laughs> I mean, these are, they're heavy dudes. You know, and I find that that's across the board from my experience. You know, I've worked with so many great classic songwriters. Um, and so many new artists as well, but you just find that often the brightest, poppiest songwriters actually have quite a dark soul, and I mean, are often makes sense. under a heavy weight, sure. right? You know, they're bringing a weight. Songwriting to what they is do. catharsis. I mean, it is exactly. Yeah, it's therapy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. height. And yep, and we are the therapists being producers, right? We're the yep. conduit into the you know. Bring I think it of out. comedians. Come on, draw it out. Yeah. I mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, comedians, I mean, the, the best comedians in the world, like Peter oh, right. Sellers. Yes, 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 of like, course. So yeah. Deep dark. depressive. Yeah, yeah, depressive, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you're still touring? You're still doing live stuff? I go out a little bit. Uh, I get it to just get, it's really quite a selfish act. It's for very much to just get my mojo back out on the road, get those demons out of my system. Um, you know, it, when I, I mean, I play on nearly every record that I do. I so I still get my chops up, I get, you know, but studio chops, as you know, are very different to playing live chops. It's very, it's a more of a reductive approach. I find that when you're playing in the studio, you're constantly trying to get the essence of a great performance by saying as little as possible on your instrument. Uh, and I'm also coaching, you know, artists in the studio in the same respect, trying to refine, refine until you just get the essence. Because the noodling aspect that you get live you, it makes people in the room feel, you know, so connected and present for this unique performance. Sure. That doesn't necessarily translate on record. So it's the two brains. And I, I do find it quite difficult going out on the road a lot because I really have to literally start thinking differently. And um, <clears throat> strangely enough, over the years, I don't know if there are other producers, I'd love to know if it's just me, but I find it hard to retain um, a lot of chord progressions in my brain these days. I used to be so good at just learning one set and you know, I could go and do multiple gigs with different bands. I have a, I have a small theory on that. I would I actually, I, I never really, cause I've always been pretty sort of, I wouldn't say ADD, but I've always done 10,000 things. Yep. I've always like, like you, I like to, you know, I like to co-write the songs, yep. play on the uh -huh. song, produce it, engineer. To me, I love being fulfilled because I didn't mm -hmm. get into music to be the guy sitting in the back being mm -hmm. like admin guy going, no, do it again. Right. I, I, I like the whole creativity. Right. So I actually found that I never quite had the patience to be the guy that sat there and charted absolutely everything perfectly and, you, you know, right. and when I was younger, my ear wasn't that developed. Now I'm older, I'm working on the track. So I think yeah. what happens is probably an articulation for what you're saying is that your ear is so developed now mm -hmm. that you actually just go in and play it. That's what happens to me. Yes. I'm working on the track for a few hours and then, oh, I've got to play acoustic. Happens all the time. Go in, pick up the acoustic and start playing the song. And I'm like, mm -hmm. put, put down a full take and then Absolutely. double it. And I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm super smart for doing it. I'm just saying my ears developed to that point now where I just know yep. the format of the song. Absolutely. I think that's true. And I think the corollary to that is that then you move on to the next thing. Yes. And you, it's gone. I yeah. empty my thoughts sure. of it. I don't need to know. And even the next day, I'll have to relearn the song yep. because I've, my, I just move on very quickly because yep. I like to move fast. And we are also in the digital domain, um, which is quite different from back when we were working on tape. We'd work on multiple songs sometimes even in a day now sure. because you can just open yep. sessions quickly. Back in the day, you'd have to you know, you'd load the reel. So it was like um, you'd tend to work longer on one song, although I, tr I do try and bring that analog aesthetic into this room. And um, I even have two different applications. I don't know if you want to go this deep yet, but I have two applications. Go as deep as you like. Great. Well, <laughs> I use Logic for painting and going quick and demoing and just super fast. 
yep. all programming, all that. But once I've tracked a band and I'm doing some overdubs approaching mix phase, I'm in Pro Tools most of the time. I bring it over. What do you think the pros and cons are? Um, I've worked in Logic as well as Pro Tools as well. I've, I've stayed with Pro Tools because it's the first DAW I learned. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like if anybody was to put a gun to my head as to why, I think it's just the audio editing capabilities just seem more straightforward to me. Yeah. But I don't know if that's... I'm not as deep on other DAWs. I hate right. saying any one thing is better than Absolutely. another. It's like whatever you use. Yeah. I could say that um, I came up with Logic when it was owned by eMagic, so I've had a very long... Okay. Association with the with the software, and I know it pretty. I know it deeply. I came to Pro Tools later, although I'm very fluent in it now. So I think I'm pretty, you know, qualified to almost like look at both and so go. What so what is it? You know, it, is one better than the other? And I think that um, both have their own strengths. I would say, and you know, um, it's only a weakness if you know the other one, right? But I see it as a weakness, sure. Sure. But editing capabilities of Pro Tools, yes, absolutely. I think it's superior, and I think it's. Um, it's just better for commitment in terms of, see, I think of Pro Tools as tape, you know, like it's my tape machine. Okay. And I think of the top playlist as just, it's a commitment. And sometimes I'll even, uh, I, I delete, I delete takes. I don't, you know, I work in destructive sometimes just to have that clearing the mind feeling. I think for the first five or 10 years, I only worked in destructive for, for a number of reasons. You probably remember if we go back early enough that if your computer crashed while you were recording right. and you weren't in destructive, you'd lose the take. Right. So we always used to, when we were tracking full live bands, we'd, we'd have that D yeah. on, the red, on the red record, and it wow. would be, because if there was any reasons why it stopped... You wouldn't lose it. You wouldn't lose it. Wow. Because you've got a whole band in there, you're yeah, in a studio, yeah. it's like $1,500 a day, half the musicians are, you know, session players, Crazy. so it's like a yeah, five yeah. or $6,000 day, right. and then suddenly you get a crash and you just lose and a whole take. And you crashes, as, you know, they're, yeah. they're more rare now, but back then, sure, you know, yeah. that would happen all the time. Um, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, so I find that logic, uh, yes, I, I find the, the comping and all that, I find it a bit frustrating. <coughs> I like to sort of commit and it doesn't want me to commit. The, the, the application wants you to have options and it thinks that it's being convenient and it is in many respects. And, um, but depending on where I, where I'm at in the process, that can be a little bit like, no, no, no I just like to commit now. You know, I don't want to have a thing where I have a million options. Um, but, um, I think, yeah, Pro Tools, also the way it talks to the, like the outboard gear, there's something about it I like, although Logic has absolutely improved that using the I.O. plugin. It even has a function where you can send, you know, like a pip out through your gear and it calculates the round trip time. Nice. And will, uh, you know, calculate the latency. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, you know, the other thing to say is that if something's sounding great in Logic, I'll just mix it in Logic. I'm not going to bring it over and up my mix. You know right. what I mean? Like, right. you know, sometimes the way you're just hitting it in a certain application, you'll never replicate that. There is the one thing I, I noticed when I first started using Logic, because it was about it was about 10 years ago, it was there was a period that everything on, on the radio, especially in the pop stuff, mm. was done in Logic. Mm. Um, I think it was about the time, you can correct me if I'm wrong, when they had those templates, those mm -hmm. the first templates came mm -hmm. out in Logic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you started he literally hearing songs with all of the presets the templates. Yeah, of the yeah, templates. Yeah. The adaptive um, limiter on every track, I think that's one of the things that it would do. Yeah, and basically yeah. it was hard to beat it. You could take those mm. files, you could print them all, drag it into Pro Tools, and you could never get it as loud and as punchy that's, yeah. as... Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I have so many artists still to this day coming in with a Logic session where they've used a template and it has a limiter on every single channel. Yeah. And how, how are you ever going to beat the loudness of that? And, it, yeah. and sometimes it's beneficial because it actually slamming in the right way. And other yeah. times it's just distorted and not good. And they've just pulled down the master fader to deal with it, which is right. obviously, if you know anything about gain structure, isn't yeah. the way to do it. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I'm certainly no snob when it comes to that. I used to be. Absolutely, I admit it. I was a snob. I was like, no, this isn't correct. This isn't right. You know, yeah, we all go through but, that. Exactly. Yeah. And then you get through to the other side and you're like, no, like just embrace what sounds awesome. Yeah. Does it sound good? Is it hitting me? That's all that matters now. And, um, you know, a lot of stuff's coming through Ableton now as well. And right. I've obviously, I mean, for me, I've stayed out of the Ableton game for the moment intentionally because I really like that concept that, Many artists are bringing Ableton sessions, but they have it on their laptop on the couch and they're not, I'm not even looking at it. I don't see it. All I'm hearing is what's coming out of it. And that's really to me all that matters, right? In terms of their creative process. So then I'll latch onto certain things out of that and I'll say, okay, look, print that or whatever, and then we'll bring it over into my system. 
But I, I, right now, I think one day I'll probably go into the Ableton universe, but right now I'm really enjoying it being an intentionally separate part. I wish we could take Ableton. This sounds like a silly thing, but I've, I thought about this many times. Take Ableton as it is now and go back to like 1978 and give it to Eno. Yeah. Because it's like, remember he was doing all that found music stuff? Right. Where him and um, uh, when, when they made uh, My Life a Bush of Ghosts, he mm -hmm. was like taking tapes off of the radio and like twisting them. Yeah, and totally. Uh, just that, I just want that kind of thinking, yeah. that brain, because I, I used uh, Ableton with Salam Remy um, like a year ago, and he would just like load things in mm -hmm. and then create MIDI off of all of these different performances that yeah. we record, and then just come up with completely different sounds. Right. And then Chris Lake was showing me a year or two ago, just like he just took like a little tiny sample of a vocal and built mm. a track out of it. That's so funny you say that. I mean, I, I used to do that for for years, you know, but like <laughs> much more mechanically, yeah. you know, before, you know, you could just MIDI map, I would literally go in and place MIDI markers over an existing thing, delete the audio, and then just use that as, as an inspiration for something else using the EXS sample or something in Logic. So it's interesting that, you know, I mean, it's just so much quicker now. I mean, you can paint very quickly, you know, using Ableton in particular, but what I'm finding, um, and I've heard this from a lot of my producer friends, is that the Ableton stuff that comes in, it's not as arrangement focused. So the song structure often is a bit of a mess and, and needs help because the brain of whoever's using Ableton often is just more caught up in the scenes and just the little loops. Sure. So it's like, um, you know, I apologize, I'm not using the right lingo for, uh, for Ableton, but, you know, because I know it has its own language, you know, sure. but I, it seems you, you get it's very quick in terms of moving between scenes, but in terms of arranging and smoothing out those sections into a coherent arc of a song, if you're indeed even in, you know, interested in doing a song, because mm -hmm. often people aren't, it's just more just a piece of sound, whatever, like in a minute and a half you know, thing, anything works. But uh, I find that that's where I come in, into the process sure. and be like, okay, I can help with that. You know, let's, yeah, let's definitely. just I print that and let's, Let's do, an, let's do a performance over the top of what you've done. Take the piano out and perform the piano from zero to three minutes 30, and it just glues everything together. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, I, I, I love this idea, I love this whole conversation. The biggest thing for me, and I want to pose this to you, is I'm going to pause for a second and get this right. I still think that when I listen to like Massive Attack and Porter's Head, that still sounds more like the future than where we're at the moment. I still mm. felt like they had this ability to take samples and electronic and blend it with organic in a way that still stand, sounds super modern and super mm. cutting edge. Mm. I think one of the, one of the things we're, we're, we're sort of facing at the moment, at least in my humble opinion, and you can completely disagree, is that we have a lot of sort of older style production ideas and a lot of really new style production ideas, but I've y not yet, maybe there are exceptions, found anything that's quite blended the two together. It seems like it's either super EDM, dance music orientated, super organic, and they're compromising too much. When yeah. they come together, all the drums that are recorded live are all edited to the grid mm -hmm. to fit the EDM stuff, or the EDM stuff is cut up and around the organic and then sound. There's something beautiful about some of those records from like the mid early 90s that just seemed to have got that. And it was probably a lot of the limitations that they were mm -hmm. playing, pressing a button on a sampler yeah. and going, and so they were having to sort of perform it. I, yeah. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong, I don't know. No, I don't, think that, I don't think there's any wrong in this discussion, but I will say that the perspective could be seen like this um, in the sense that in the 90s, there was still room in the <clears> technology <throat> to do something new. Uh, in the sense that That's using an Akai sampler then yeah. was so radical for the time. I, I don't feel like the technology right now, it's really hard to find, you know, a kid these days, you know, who's a millennial or whatever, or even like the next generation coming through, where they look at something and go, whoa, that's, that's I've never seen, you know. Right. They've kind of seen it all. <laughs> like, right. It's, you know, it's out there on YouTube if you want to see it, or it, the laptop itself has versions of things and even the interfaces of, you know, all the plugins kind of made to look like old things. I find that they actually see something old and will go, wow. Oh, interesting. Right? So that's like a very different perspective from going, wow, look at this new sampler that just came out. We could try and do this and this and this with it. Um, and also the other difference I find that, is that right now we're in this sort of post-post world. It's a bit philosophical, but like post-post. No, it's post-post modern yeah. because 
you know, the postmodern world said, oh, you know, these fixed ideas that were before, this is the proper way to record, or, you know, you wear a lab coat if you're an engineer, or all of these <laughs> ideas which are very fixed. People were like, oh, no, we don't, actually don't need to hold ourselves to that. We can just see it for what it is rather than be it, right? So if I want to be an engineer and wear, you know, like, you know, overalls, you know, like Steve Albini, like, you know, he'll just put on the overalls as a kind of like throwback joke to it. But that's a postmodern thing. No one was joking. Like, you know, Jeff Emmerich wasn't, uh, Emmerich wasn't joking when he put on the white. He just had to. Right? So that's a very different mentality. And I find that, um, you know, in the 90s, there were still new things to try, new technologies, new ways of recording drums, new equipment coming out. Right now, I feel like we have the entire palette of the 50s, 60s, or back to the 20s even. Whatever era you want, you can just draw upon like this, and then you can pretty much just do it. And even the knowledge of like pulling a drum sound, I mean, it took me years to get that, what you'd call a vintage drum sound, like dial it and just get it and just understand the fine tuning of it now. And now I could go onto YouTube and pretty much get a good tutorial of it, get a basic understanding, and then do the trial and error in real life, but it's all expedited. So everything is just the palette is there for you, you can choose. So the mindset of Portis Head and Massive Attack back then I think it was significantly different to someone doing sure. experimental music now. And you can still experiment, but just the parameters are, are just very different. I did have fun at Superbooth this year because it was very hardware based, which was a lot of fun. So you've got lots of guys and girls making little, you know, synth modules right. and, and stuff. And I felt like that was an interesting perspective Absolutely. because it was tactile. Yes. And there's something really enjoyable about like reaching over and like, you know, manipulating sound Absolutely. and listening to between, you know, between a pair of speakers and going, oh, what's that doing? Not that it doesn't exist with a mouse, mm -hmm. but I think that there's still a, an essence of performance. Like all music is performed, even mm -hmm. it has to be performed at first when you're writing something, yeah. you know, you have to improvise, you have to perform. Um, I suppose even then, even if you're singing in the melody, you know, it's mm -hmm. still a performance. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Oh, the modular thing's fascinating because it's yeah. having a complete, like, I mean, could you call it a resurgence, I suppose, you know, from the Susan Chiani days or whatever, but it's like, it's just happening and it I is think very it's, much I think about, it's a new thing. I, don't, I think it's less of a resurgence because I don't yeah. think it was ever really at the forefront. No, it was never. It was yeah. so, like, maybe three or four people would yeah. be, you know, these scientists, you know, yeah. would be doing it, you know, the BBC workshop or whatever. But uh, it's amazing what's happening. I think you're absolutely right that there's that tactile nature of it. Yep. And it's the same thing of when an Ableton artist who's never worked in a studio will come in here, they'll immediately go to the vintage stuff and twiddle some knobs because they're just like, wow. The Mellotron's an interesting one. There's a Mellotron over here. They'll come and get straight on the Mellotron. I say, wow, I've only seen the plug-in of this. You know, they have the Mtron or whatever. But... You know, I'll show them, I'll be like, yeah, yeah, it's super cool, but like you put that through guitar pedals and get some randomness happening, it can be awesome. But like it's if a word you I want, love random. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you want something just like it sounds like a Mellotron, you're almost better using the M-Tron because it's gonna be more in tune than this yeah. guy. You know what I mean? Which is yeah. like so old, right? Yeah. So it's about what are you using it for, you mm -hmm. know, for me. It's like the fetishistic aspect of it is just like, look, get rid of that. Like it's not about the fetish like wow, look at the aesthetic of this thing. Sure. It's just like, no, no, just follow. Like if you, if the plug-in wins, the plug-in wins. Who gives a shit? Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You always go back to your ear. No, I, I completely understand. And I've got some great guitar sounds as a guitarist by recording guitar, manipulating um, with plug-ins, happy accidents, things feeding back on themselves, mm -hmm. creating that I'll never get again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, I uh, love the never get it again kind absolutely. of idea. Everything I do is never get it again. <laughs> Everything I do, I create a situation that is totally self-sabotaging. I don't want to go back to it. I don't want to be able to go back to it. Actually, I mean, now and again, if there's a particular synth sound or something on a non-recallable synth, I'll take a photo. Just in case. Because and just hope that one millimetre either way doesn't completely change. There it. will be a difference. As yeah. you know, even yeah. recalling a mix on an SSL, there's always something different. Yeah. Always something. The voltage never, is like one volt less never, and the low end isn't quite as big as it was yesterday. Those like, recalls ah. never sounded the same to me. Yeah. Ever. No, there there's always did. something. And even though we were doing it on a K, you know, SSLK where you had the screen which told you when you got the precise, I mean, you know, we weren't doing it from snapshots or, or, or recall sheets. You know, the outboard was recall sheets, but the console itself was recalled, you know, so precisely, but it never sounded the same. Yeah, I have a 4000, same thing. You sit right. there and you keep yeah. tweaking it, and there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, on the mixing side of things, it's, you know, 
speaking of SSLs, you know, I train uh, as a mixer on SSLs and I miss it a lot. I, ha I can't deny it. What do you find that you miss working on an SSL that you don't get mixing in a box? It's the, um, again, that word tactile comes into it because, you know, it is that thing where you can do several things at once. Mm -hmm. I like that, that you could twiddle several knobs and then grab the fader. It's, you know, ironically faster. That's interesting. You know, I've never heard that argument and it makes perfect sense. Mm. I can sit there and boost the top and cut the mid range on two independent things at the same time. Yes. And go, oh, yeah. I like the way those relate to each other. There's the sweet right. spot. And Rather that relation, than clicking on the mouse and then clicking. But that's, that's what a console is all about. Uh, and recording on consoles is, import, is an yeah. important distinction too, that the, the notion of recording on a console has sort of gone out of fashion. Now it's about having outboard, it's very eclectic. Sure. You've got your tubes on the, you know, the kick drum and the bass, and then you've got the, you know, and I totally do that. Like, you know, I'm a total victim of that. But there's something beautiful about saying no. We're only using the preamps on the console and the oh, EQ on the console because it's complementary. I've been, I've been, and I will continue to say this, I've been, I've been saying to people, go out and buy a used-to-be $30,000 console, DDA, TAC, AMEC. These consoles used to be twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars yeah. that I see going online for anywhere from seven hundred and fifty bucks yeah. to about twenty five hundred. Yeah. Neotech, I mean, so many great records are made on. Yeah, them. so these consoles mm. are like totally affordable. And talk about a quick and easy way to get into like twenty four channels of mic pre's that could record a drum kit. Yeah, much cheaper way of going than trying to buy twenty four independent channels of, of mic pre's. Yeah. And I don't know, it's, if I had like a garage set up now and I was starting again, I'd probably go out and buy a used DDA console for yeah. like 1500 bucks. I, I don't think a day goes by that I don't think about it. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> you know, it's just, it's just one of those situations where because I've had the experience of working on consoles, you know, I, uh, I think about it a lot. And um, there's also that thing of, you know, taking your eyes off, you know. I always had the screen on the side. I would never put the screen in the middle when I was working on consoles which is bad for one ear, but... Uh, yeah. Well, I just got another console, mm -hmm. and I, I, we're going to do a whole video on it, but I just got another 24-channel console. Right. A modern, all-singing, all-dancing console. We're going to do a whole video on it, yeah. specifically for this, mm -hmm. just to sort of like, to say, you know what, consoles are still relevant. Now, mm. it doesn't mean that I don't have fun mixing in the box. So all my live streams I do are always mixed in the box because I'm trying to relate to people yeah. and say, this is all you have access to and let's see if we can make these drums sound good. And I, I always provide limitations, like yeah. let's only use stock plugins or let's only yeah. use this manufacturer's, yeah. Yeah. you know, because some people only own Absolutely. X, Y, and Z. And, and let's face it, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is kind of esoteric sure. in a way because you can do all of this stuff. I'm, I'm working like, you know, I mean, I, I sum which we'll go into, but um, so I do get out into the analog domain, but um, it's essentially in the box in the sense that the environment is digital. Um, and it's incredible, you know, it's, I love it, it's great. And it allows me to work on an incredible, uh, you know, large amount of work at any one time. I think, yes, I agree. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a parallel with the studio in is that sometimes I'll go and track a band, the, the, the drums and the basics, you know, like the whole band performing live in a mm -hmm. studio, like Sunset Sound for one to three days. Mm -hmm. We can do a whole record these days in three days of yeah. basics, especially if they were rehearsed, uh, maybe even less. I'm sure I've done an album in a day, I'm sure you have too. You know, you do what you have to do. But the, part of the reason why I go there is for the experience. They walk into a room, they're like, oh wow, this is where the Doors or Zeppelin or the Stones tracked. Mm -hmm. And their whole creativity level goes up to another level and they get all mm -hmm. excited and they see the Doors playing the records and Zeppelin and, and, and they just come in and there's a sense of focus. That also could be true of a console. You see a yeah. console and you're like, oh yeah, I've seen pictures of like Jimmy Page or Jimi Hendrix or David Bowie leaning over a console. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something... like an emotional, yeah, and these things are important psychologically because ultimately records are about capturing a moment in time. If that Absolutely. moment in time can be special, then why not make it special, right? Sure. Totally agree with that. I, you know, I'm sure you've had this too. I've had experiences where it can be the inverse to what you intend because they go into a big room and, and if people are inexperienced of being in a studio, it can be a bit intimidating and you don't get the best performances. I've had that as well. Right. But in saying that... Um, you know, of course, you know, going into a beautiful room, you know. But there's also in LA, there's a, there's so many of those mid-tier studios which actually aren't as famous but have that magical essence, but they're comfortable too, right? And they're full of gear, like in terms of instruments. Right. So I love working in those rooms as well. There's a place over in Highland Park called 64 Sound where I do a lot of tracking and it's wall-to-wall -wall instruments and they have 
a console gear, they've got a 3M tape machine. So it's all, it's all there, you know. And I find that when I go in with bands, it's just a playhouse. Kind of like this is a playhouse, but it's bigger. It's got the air around the sounds. Um, and there's enough rooms I find in LA that you can really pick your palette. So if you want to go for a drier drum sound, you can go to that room or you can go to this room for the big bombastic kind of open thing. Or if you want to put the whole band on the floor with spill, there's great rooms for that too. Um, you know, where you can, you know, have good separation with everyone on the floor, including guitar amps. I mean, you know, that's... That's what I'm loving about LA, that deep choice of studio. Oh, it's insane. There's ridiculous. so many incredible studios. It's ridiculous, yeah. And then, like you were pointing out, you know, with the Australian markets, we've got the same thing here. You go to some people's home studios and you walk in and there's a Neve and a huge control, a huge live room and you're like, what? Yeah. And that's totally. the home studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Which I think that culture has been prevalent for decades, though. I don't think that was... You know, most of the guys I know that have those setups yeah. have had them since 80s or 90s. Totally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, obviously it's more prevalent now. Yeah. And I do find that, you know, what you have here as a room, I get asked about every day. People say, oh, do you know anybody that's yeah, renting out a space? All the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I bet all you get people going, is there a room available in your place? All the time. I've helped them fill the room next door twice already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, all the time, you know. And uh, this is, you know, as small as I'd want to go. It's good because I do have a drum room in there where I, do, I can get that tight boothy drum sound. Yep. I've got an upright piano. Okay, I'm good. But um, any smaller, I'd be like, well, I'd need to fit the piano at least. Right. Uh, that's really important to me just because, I, you know, even when I'm writing, I'll often, I mean, I always start just with something real world, you know, whether it's a piano or a guitar or whatever. I'm the same way. I just have to feel like I'm writing a song that I'd be proud yeah. of. <laughs> I mean, I've done it. You know, I, uh, you know, my publisher in Sydney, I was in Sydney recently and I, I wrote a song on a whim there, you know, and my publisher had a writing room, but it was, you know, a white room with a computer in it. You know, which to me either, you know, it feels like Space Odyssey 2001, something very minimalist. And I had to sort of dig pretty deep to sort of go, okay, where do I start? Once you get going, whatever, right? But just to get that inspiration, I found like there was a bass. So at least I had a bass, I could put it through a delay and go, oh, there's something. I love writing you know. the bass sometimes. I think it's pretty fantastic. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially because I'm sure I get a total sense that you're going to agree with this. To me, you know, there's only two types of music, the good and the bad. So at the same time, I can go Beatles, you know, jazz, but I can also go Joy Division. And like you sure. plug in a bass and you can like start playing melody with an open D string. Oh, yeah. And I can write, you can write a whole song around Absolutely. a bass melody. Anything that isn't what it, you know, what you're used to can just be so inspirational, especially when you treat it like, say, treating a bass like a guitar or get a guitar and turn it upside down or... Sure. You know, just just mess with it as much as possible. You well, know. I agree. One four five on a piano to me is a lot more interesting than a one four five on a guitar. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'm playing and I'm like, oh, it's sweet, and then I realize yeah. I'm literally just playing one four five with maybe, you know, maybe yeah. a pedal note. Absolutely. But yeah, I'm yeah. still really just playing a one four five, but I'm pedaling something a little dissonant. Exactly. <laughs> and where your fingers are going will give you a completely different emotional response, and that's what you're looking for at the the outset of writing a song. It's always about, okay, how can, how can we just find a tendril of something mm -hmm. to then follow? Job. And it has to feel a certain way. If it doesn't give you any feeling, then you're never going to go on that path to something great. You know? And so, so often you know, a, a musician will come in with their guitar and I'll say, look, just put that outside. And they're immediately like, ooh, okay, they're, on, they're in some other territory. Yep. So I'll say, now go on the piano, play a single note, and let's see what that gives us. And you know, suddenly you're away. You Marvelous. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some gear. Yeah, let's, let's do let's, a little uh, mini tour here. Let's do it. Can we start with monitors? Of course, yep. I do, are those 1031s? Yes. Marvellous. I've always used them. Um, they get a lot of flack. Do they? Yes, a lot of fellow producers will come in, um, not to mention any names, Rob Schnapp. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Rob, he's just down the street, Yes, yeah, he? so he's across the street. And we'll definitely, uh, oh yeah, what are you using those for? But the thing is for me with monitoring is that whatever you're used to, right? It doesn't, you know... Come here, use your flat, because I love them. They were like I've an industry standard in LA. They absolutely, and in Australia, and um, I just came up on them. So for me, they're home territory. Right. Those, you know, and um, NS10s as well. But I always just like these because I'm a bass player. Right. I used to track in front of them a lot, and sure. I like to track loud when I'm tracking bass. Everything else, I'll bring it down, but bass, I like you to feel it. I want to feel it, right? Yeah. So nothing does it like those. I've used all sorts of others you know, atoms or whatever, but I always just either blow them or um, they wig out in some way. But these, even when they red light, they're still giving you some vibe. Oh, yeah. So I love them for that. And um, I've never blown a yeah, general. They're all rounders. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think I've ever blown a Genelec. No. Now you're making me think about it. I've blown pretty much every speaker ever made, but never yep. a Genelec. Yep. No, they're very hardy and... Uh, Wonderful. They're pleasant, you know, to work on all day, you could say. What, what's those sitting next to those? So these are AE1s, Acoustic Energy British speakers. Um, I think they were made in the 80s at first. I'm not sure when they date to. They are uh, passive speakers. They have an amp under there. Um, what are you driving them with? It's just a Yamaha, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm not sure. Um, a P something or other. Yes. Yeah. Um, something I was recommended. There's a f whole community of people with these speakers in LA that I've worked with. It's of the Nigel Godrich school. He started using them. And then mm. there's all of Beck's people and um, a good friend of mine, Joey Warnock, a very good producer and drummer, hit me to them initially. And, um, and uh, I got a pair and I've been very pleased with them. They are, it's like taking the Gentle X and then just taking all that um, pleasantness out of it that is, might be just sort of um, soothing you into thinking something sounding amazing. <laughs> and I will just give you, okay, look, honestly, this is what's going on, but it's still very pleasant. So I find them more pleasant to listen to than NS10s. Um, and they're also quite full range because they're ported. Mm -hmm. You can even track bass through them and they'll, they'll handle it. They're oh, kind of amazing for very small speakers. They're kind of insane, actually, I have to say. Um, but I don't like going between the two too often. It's more like I'll just live on it for a while. And then I'll go back to Gentle X to go, okay, what's really happening in that? Like, let me just enjoy the song for a bit, sit on the couch. Ah. But if I really want to hear what the kick drum is doing, for instance, in, a, in a, a track where it's, you know, like a live kit, it'll give me that sense of what the whole kick drum's doing, the acoustic space around the kick drum, much more than the Gentle X will. Oh, wow. It's interesting. It's like dialing into the reality. Acoustic energy. Yep, AE ones. They're the original ones. I got some older ones, but they did do a reissue called AE One Classics, which are reportedly just as good, they're exactly the same, um, but they've stopped making them, so they're sort of getting expensive now for parts and all that. Ah, the usual, the usual thing. Yes, I'll things. regret it one day. So um, let's talk about the coil, um, because the coil audio, I, I just got turned onto this fairly recently, mm -hmm. and you were sort of the recommended user that I should talk to about them. Oh, that's good. That's good to hear. Um, I am a huge fan. I came to them very organically. I was working out at... Um, um, Arc Studios in Omaha, Mike Mogus' spot, and he was, I think, pretty much the first guy that they sent a bunch of the modular ones <coughs> to. So I had six of them on a record, and I got to really put them through their paces. I had a, um, V72s, V76s. I had um, a whole bunch of other tube pre's that I knew and loved, so I had a good reference point to know what I was doing. Right. Because as we know, you know, you're working to, working to any studio, you know, something might sound wonderful there, but then you take it back to your studio, like, oh, shit, you know, maybe it wasn't as good as I thought. But right. I had enough reference points, so I could go V76 and then go to these and go, okay, that's what it's telling me. So there's two, um, there's two types that they have, the CA70 and the CA286. I have a single unit of the, two, the CA70 down here as well. This is the single rack unit, which is basically just one of these. Um, it's a two-stage preamp. So there's a tube that's driven both at the input stage and there's one at the output stage as well. So depending on how, dr how you drive into the preamp, that's going to give you one color. But if you knock it back and then you don't drive too hard into the preamp, you can, you can drive harder on the output. And both have a, have a different character. Most importantly, though, that the input is driving into these other features here. So, first of all, the first thing to recognize is that it's very old school. It's almost like a broadcasty sort of 1950s aesthetic where you start at Unity and you knock it back rather than turning it up. Right. So, that's actually as hot as it gets, and then you can go minus 6 dB steps backwards. So, right. first of all, you know, for a lot of, I think, you know, people that haven't worked with a lot of old gear, they're immediately confused by that. But for me, it's a really nice old school way of working because I know that with a U47, it's going to be on uni, it's going to be very hot, but then I can manage it. But then I can just knock it back and it's hitting the rest of the gear in a, in a very different way. And I really like that. So the philosophy there, I, I immediately liked. Um, this high, to be honest, I rarely knock it back because I find they're quite dark sounding anyway. Okay. I would only really, you know, and... Well, we'll get to it, but this this is really where the excitement happens in it for me. Um, this is the negative feedback feature. So basically, it's I, I don't quite understand. I'm not really a boffin in terms of what goes on back here. I'm more like what goes on here and how it makes me feel. So right. in saying that, 
when you wind in the negative feedback, it's almost like it's taking the top end and the sizzly and, and harsher high mids of the, of the signal and running it back through the gear so that it clamps down on the top end and makes it less of a harmonic splashy kind of sound. So, mm. And it's quite savage. So if you go all the way you know, with a condenser mic, it actually clamps down on that top end and the harsh mids quite, quite, in quite a noticeable way. But it then, you can then put it into other gear and then wind that top end and back in. Or, you know, so it's, it's not, smoother. It's, it's much smoother. It's really noticeable. But if you go all the way here, it's, much, it's more transparent, it's more open, you would say. Um, so I love that feature because I tend to do a lot of, you know, condensers on overheads. I often use U47s as overheads, U67s, wow. um, C37s, that kind of thing. So I like to be able to clamp down on it if the drums are sounding a bit harsh in the room or whatever. Um, and even for vocals, sometimes if the vocalist, you know, you've got to be subtle with it. But um, so the CA70 is a much darker sounding preamp. It's got the same features on the CA286, but if you imagine it, that this is more of a 1950s American kind of sound, this is a bit more of that British aggressive 60s kind of sound. And I, I often will put, you know, an, a mono overhead on drums and I'll just go between them and it's immediately clear which one's going to work mm. better for the program material, like whatever the drummer's playing, how hard they're hitting. This is more exciting. This is more heavyweight. The CA70 is that more American heavy, warmer, fatter. CA286 is more like that kind of exciting British, you know, it's almost like the red console or something. Oh, interesting. Yeah, which, you know, I have a clone of one of those down there as and, well. And is it doing exactly the same things on the EQs? Yeah, it's the same. So you have this low as well, which isn't an EQ as such. It just presents the low end information that's already there a little bit more forward in the, um, you know, they call it a sound stage, which is a nice way to think of it, actually. Mm -hmm. If you think of just this one, whatever that one microphone is doing as a stage of sound, it presents the bottom end a little bit more forward. But again, that might be counterintuitive. If you're playing bass, you already have that bottom end there. You might not actually want to boost it. You might actually want to knock it back so that you get more of the mid-range, mm. right? So sometimes you, you think counter to what the dial's telling you. Interesting. Well, I'm excited to try them out. Yeah, they're awesome. They're, you know, and you can drive one into the other if you want to get that real distorted sound too, which oh, is, fantastic. sounds amazing. I love how they've built their own kind of rack. They're just doing what they want. <laughs> it's just really kind of cool. Yeah, well, that's another feature actually is that they have these output transformers that you can actually, they're literally, you take it out and you can plug a different transformer in for a different flavor. I mean, ah. it's super deep, you know, and um, when you get the modular unit, you get different types of these transformers. Oh, and then you can, you can really cater your sound. It's so. interesting. There's something about the look of them. Yeah. Because I had, I had uh, Jack Douglas come over the other day and he saw this and went, whoa, whoa, what is this? Put me in contact with the guys. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. didn't even put audio through. No, it's ridiculous. And when you have, <laughs> I, I like the modular aspect because you can choose which of these flavors you prefer, put it together, and there's your drum sound because it fits six. So essentially, you know, for your main drum sound, you've got the six channels and then the rest might be utility anyway, like a snare under, for instance, you wouldn't necessarily need a heavyweight so. tube preamp for. You might want a bit more transparency anyway. Right. You might just dial in an API or something, but, you know, for the overheads, for the kick drum, you want that saturation and it's heavyweight tube stuff. You don't need compression on it unless you want the artifact of compression on it. Beautiful. If you get my meaning, if you want the timing and the splashiness of a Fairchild, sure, put it on. But if you are using it just to control the dynamic, the uh, the transients, you don't need it. That's what I love about tube gears. You don't really need a compressor a lot of the time right. for transient control because it's depending on how you treat that front end, it's gonna it's gonna smoothen that smoothen out and out. Yep. yeah, control the transients for you. That's amazing. Now we got some old favorites, the Distressor. Yeah, classic. It's one of those things I've always said to myself, oh, I'll get another one eventually, but I still haven't got another one. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it gets used every day. It's a, it's a modern classic. Overstayer. Now this looks, uh, this looks deep. Yeah, this thing is so deep. It's insane. Um, and when I first saw it, I almost laughed because I was like, no piece of gear should be that complicated. <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I tried it out, I had to buy it. I could not give it back. Uh, Jeff Terzo at um, Overstayer went over to his place. He's over in um, North Hollywood and um, or Studio City, and he, he uh, has a workshop there, and the, the guy is a, 
a genius. I mean, he's very musical in the way he thinks about the gear. It's it's not really, when you st start digging in, you realize it's not really made by someone who's just thinking about engineering. He's thinking about music. This is not the mic pre version. So on the mic pre version, you'd go like that. It's in preamp mode. These are the, um, the gains for the two mic pre's. It's a stereo unit. Um, th this doesn't have mic pre's in it. However, when you do engage pre, it does bring these into play, which are driving the whole unit and they're quite aggressive. So if you want to go super aggressive from the beginning, you can do that. Um, this is the input level. Post these, but it's the input to the entire um, unit. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, it's got three main sections, basically. So these are filters um, and these are different curves. And when I was talking to Jeff, I was like, well, this is more kind of exciting and savage and this is a bit more like a musical, like on a console. Um, and I thought, oh, that's almost like rock or dance music. And he said exactly that's how he thought about it. So when you get the peak all the way up, these actually self-oscillate. They actually, you can even tune a note. I mean, they go, ooh, or ooh, you know, and it's <laughs> savage. You'll blow, you won't blow a Genelec, but you'll blow speakers doing it. Um, <laughs> So you can get that super splashy and exciting, or you can just do subtle, subtle filtering, almost like on a console, like a high pass, low pass filter kind of situation. Um, then you have the EQ section, which has a nice sort of broad um, bass or lows, and then highs, same kind of thing, open and, and nice. And then you've got this um, parametric mid-range, which is very, um, it's quite savage. So even on 2dB, you've get, you're getting quite a sound. So it's almost like smooth and then really particular for shaping of something exciting using that. Then you've got, um, this is the compressor section. Behavior, um, if you go all the way up, it's doing some of the most crazy stuff that you're likely to hear out of a compressor when you bring the threshold right down. So it's, it's sort of creating a relationship between the, the attack and release for you. Mm -hmm. so that you can just turn this behavior until it's sort of timing the right way for you because there is no attack and release on there. Um, and so depending on what you're putting through it, you'll just be mixing the behavior with the threshold and finding that, and then you've got this makeup. Um, the makeup gain, you only need to do a tiny little thing like that because it's savage. It's, um, it's intense. Um, and then you've got, you've got fast, medium, slow, fast, medium, slow for the um, attack and release. And um, between all that, it's a ridiculous compressor. Um, and this is the final part. This is the drive, which goes, it drives these three different types of saturation. This is the MAS, which is in his, one of his other pieces of gear, like a, a sort of mastering unit, uh, which has three different types of harmonics in it. This is the saturator, which is a bit more noticeable and hex is like full destruction. <laughs> so that'll full just create, yeah, you'll, it's the end of the world basically. So <laughs> you can get a combo of any of those for that. Now, all of this ends up on these three mixes. This is dry. Yep. This is in and out, so you engage by flicking them up. This is the dry signal, which you yep. can have with the EQ or without. This is the compressor, just the compressor signal. And this is this drive signal. Although most of the action of this unit exists on this knob here, because what you choose to send to the, the saturation signal is over here. You can choose to put the filter in there, the EQ or the compressor or none. So you can just have it as a subtle saturation or you can go all of these things, create an absolute world of just complete <laughs> and then it will end up on that there. If, it's, if you only want it to be like a side chainy underneath a clean signal thing, no problem. You just keep the dry signal up. These are attenuators, so that's unity at 10. And then you attenuate that back and just mix in a little bit. Hmm. So it's... I mean, I've only just scratched the surface, honestly. What, it's no, crazy. I can tell. So, so what are you primarily using this on? Well, I have different uh, applications uh, and I'm still exploring it. I've only had it for about a year and I'm still just going, you know, I'm just scratching the surface with it. Um, but the two prim primary ways I'm using it at the moment is one is on the mix bus as a, in a subtle kind of way. So I'm only really just mixing in little bits of the compressor and bits of the saturation on maybe that. But... Um, the other way I like to use it is with really creative drummers that I work with. I'll give them the overheads through here because it's stereo. Mm -hmm. um, I'll keep all the other mics dry, but I'll completely mess up the overheads and get them sucking and talking with a time kind of mm. timing to the drums thing so that it's so savage that they'll just do a little click on a, on a, on a rack tom you know, this, with a side stick 
and it'll create this crazy rhythmic effect where it's sucking. It sounds like I've got 20 plugins on, on a channel. Honestly, it's crazy. And, uh, you know, I've just got so many recordings of drummers finishing a take and going, what was that? You know, like they're <laughs> freaking out. Like what? They've never, you know. It's Great. insane. It's an insane piece of gear. But um, I love yeah. some eclectic choices here. Pretty eclectic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're going to uh, a, a personal favourite and probably a favourite of many people, a very new. Yeah. I got this um, for the mix bus, really. And um, lately I have been exploring it as a tracking compressor in the limit um, mode. As a compressor, it's subtle, you know, and it does this thing on the mix bus that I've tried all the mix bus compressors out there. And at one point, I had a studio back in Australia that was housed in what, you know, you call the Abbey Road of Australia. It's a big studio. Mm -hmm. And they gave me one of everything to try. So for a, a good three months, I had, you know, the, the 2500, I had the SSL compressor, the smart compressor, um, this, you know, and I had them all there and I was just a being. So I got to know them all very well, and this just won for me. I just loved it. Um, even when it's just doing one dB on the mix, it does something that the others just, Amazing. just don't. It's beautiful, yeah. I mean, mastering engineers use it, so I mean, I always feel this pretty confident I can put this on my, on my mix bus if, yep. uh, if a mastering engineer is putting it in their chain. Yeah, in fact, the one that I had back in Australia was a mastering engineer's, um, and it had you know the indented and all that kind of stuff, all that step stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I made sure I got it with the um, this mod in there uh, with the um, high pass filter. Okay. And they just stay in always. I where are they? Where are they set? Um, I think it's eighty or a hundred. I, I don't know. So it's let, letting the low end just breathe a little bit. It just yeah, it just lets it through. Yep. And I think that that's you know when you got on a mix bus, it's kind of what you want. You know, unless you know SSL compressors sound great with the bottom end just going. Pff, you know. I don't find that this does what an SSL does in the sense that an SSL compressor, you can be like compressing like, you know, I mean, I've worked with, you know, Bob Clear Mountain and he's like, it's hitting super hard, yep. right? It's compressing like this and it sounds awesome. I wouldn't do that with this. This is more like I want it around 1, 2 dB and yep. I like it. It's good. It's, it's, that's how I've always used them, either on a mix bus. Quite often for me, it was on guitar buses, mm -hmm. especially if I've got lots of subgroups of, of guitars yeah. all going on and then it comes back on one, maybe VCA awesome. or something. Maybe I can group that before and have it all going through this. Yep, another reason why I used to like working on consoles. Yeah. I'd, I'd have the four stereo buses on the K and I'd have that on two. I'd have two distresses on another one, Fairchild on another, I mean, and then two two five fours on the other one. And it was just like, okay, how, what flavor? That sounds yeah. rather lovely. I've never yeah. done that that many buttons. Well, it's like that Michael Brow style where you can just send things off the small fader and create a whole nother compressed right. mix. And then you just, you know, you just got to get your gain structure right. That's all. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Next up, another beautiful piece. Yeah. The Chandler. The Xena. Yeah. I love the Xena. Had it for years. It was the first expensive compressor I bought and, you know, never turned back. And still exploring it again because really, it's uh, you know it's obviously dual, but um, each com each side really has kind of three compressors in it. These two are actually very similar, so it's really the two. But the limit is so different from this comp one and comp two that really it's like two different things. Um, and where are you favouring this? Uh, in, in terms of where I use yeah. it, yeah, um, I use it on everything, man. Okay. Like, I never used to use it on vocals, but lately I've been using it on vocals and I've been loving it, like really hitting it too, like at 8 dB, like I love it. When you get it dancing, it's really special. And it has this sound that it's so not tubey. It's just not a tube compressor in any way, but it still has its own flavor and its own something, right. you know, that's so exciting. Because a lot of people will say, you know, like you need your you know, um, very new tube compressor for vocals or whatever, but I find it can be super exciting. Yeah, I, I love it, you know. And then stereo on the piano, always on the piano. It just sits Wonderful there. Wonderful piece. With, yeah. Brent Averills. Yep, also had them forever. Um, I was working out here one year and the guy who owned the studio, he knew I liked his ones and he said, hey man, on Gear Slut, some guy's selling them. And I got them for a steal and I've never turned back. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I always recommend, people are always ask me, I just want to get a preamp just to start, and I right. always say just get a Brent Avril 1272, although he calls them something, I think he calls them a 1073 something. Right, right. But it's really a 1272 preamp, that's what you want. The EQ's yep. sweet, like it's awesome, but really it's just 
the 1272 preamps, they are just so good. Beautiful. Um, what do we got going on down here? So these are two quad eight modules. Oh, that, yeah. They're called MM403s. Um, these were taken out of um, a console built for the ABC in Australia, which is like the BBC of Australia, um, a broadcast console. And um, so I got two of the channels. Um, they're totally awesome. They are so sick. And the EQ in particular is amazing. I often do this, just run them on 10 on full and you can just choose a flavor and they just sit there beautifully. It's quite a, it must be quite a wide curve, I suppose, in the Q end of things. And um, this has been modded so that this was the echo send, but this is now an output level. So oh, I can I drive into it over here. Um, now this is continuous, kind of regret having him do that. I would have preferred it to have the old steps just because that's how my brain thinks. Like I like this old school step thing in terms of the, the preamp gain, but whatever. Um, yep. You know, so you can really gain it up and drive these. They sound really great. And it's got an overload button. So you see when it's really, uh, this little light here starts lighting up. Um, and this is an output so I can wind it right back if I want to drive it. Um, it has, you know, EQ in and out. And then you, you can make the, the high frequency and the low frequency a shelf by hitting that in. Or you can keep it like that. It's quite fantastic. Quad, quad eight have been one of those things that sort of like, I always feel like they're bubbling under. Mm -hmm. You know, people are talking about them yeah. and I get a little bit of excitement and then I don't hear about it for a little bit and then I come back and yeah. someone's excited about them. I mean, every studio I like in LA that's like a, a, a privately owned studio or like a really eclectic studio, they all have some of these mm. or a variation of them. There are a lot floating around in, in the film world, you know, like there's the Star Wars ones that are floating around and ah. Star Wars is mixed on and all that. And uh, you just find like they're just totally awesome. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it totally sits with the Neve in a beautiful space. And I mean, then I, the other thing, talking to Rob, yeah. MCIs. Yes, totally. And yeah. MCIs is the same kind of thing, like where they're not as sexy maybe or whatever, right. but they're just workhorses. Like you can just do a record on them. And I used to work in a studio in Australia that had what I call all brown MCI. It was a brown MCI with a brown MCI tape machine, two inch tape, and you could go all brown. You know, you just go <laughs> tape, console, There's your brown nothing sound, else. It is the sound of the 70s. That's it. So the call hourly power supply? No? Yeah. Oh, no, this is the single, sorry, this is the single micro. That's the single channel. It has an internal power supply. Um, ah. Yep. You know, you can go line level too. So if you've got two of them, you can run your mix through them. It's got that old tube console kind of sound, Beautiful. which is cool. You know, phase, and that's your gain. That's the low negative feedback feature that I told you about. And that's the output signal there. And uh, that lately has been sitting on my, um, the U47 for vocals. That's it. Like... Uh, I love it. And then what have we got down here? This thing's weird. It's um, made by a guy, I can't remember his name. I met him in Omaha. He had a couple of units over there and lent me this one and I bought it on the spot because I fell in love with it. Dizengoff Audio. Um, he used to run Black Lion. Oh, okay. Mods of 002s and stuff yeah, back in the day. Them, and he yeah. sold that company, started making these. He basically put, he told me he put less into the sort of face plate, like less money in, into the face plate and all this stuff and put it all into what's behind there and basically was able to sell them for really cheap. So I got this for a steal and um, it's basically a preamp from the red console Beatles kind of thing. So it's like you've just got gain. This is a trim, but it's only like I think one dB in each direction. So it's really kind of nothing. Oh, I see. <laughs> it's sort of there for show, but it's really about this. So basically... Each step is almost like it doesn't get louder, it just gets more saturated. That's the oh, best way to think of it. Nice. So it's, if you go all the way with a tube mic on drums or something, it's just destroyed. Um, but you can pad it up and then it's quite transparent. But the volume output level in Pro Tools will always kind of look the same. It's always hitting the same mm -hmm. level, but it's just this, you know, saturation box. So it, it, when I do mono drums, um, it's... Or piano. It's, <laughs> it was on piano on the last record we did. That's right. On a, uh, I think I had a C12A on the piano just as a mono. It was a vintage, like I was going super old school. I love C12As on pianos. Okay. So coming back over here, what do we have at the top here? This thing is uh, probably the the best named piece of gear out there these <laughs> days. It's called the Urkdal Moisturizer. The Urkdal Moisturizer. The Urkdal Moisturizer, yeah. So this thing is basically, <laughs> it's a reverb tank, but the springs are exposed. So, um, and then it has a whole set of filters. So you can actually 
play these springs as you put uh, the signal of the reverbs going through here so you can actually create these thunderous sounds. Right. Although I don't really use it for that much anymore because you get over that pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, you're going to use that destructive, destructive sound maybe <laughs> once. Once every year, couple of years. Yeah. But um, what ends up uh, happening is you. I've found that you put a guitar or synths sound fantastic through it. So that it comes through and you can do a mix here between the reverb and yep. just the dry signal going through these filters. Um, so the if you go, it says dry or soup. If you go all the way to soup, it's a <laughs> completely wet signal. Um, and then you've got like an output level. And this is um, the level of the filter mixed in as well. And it's... So, sorry, what's the filter? So the filter is over here. Yep. Um, I wish I had a piece of music going through it right now because it's actually quite difficult to explain how this thing sounds. It's crazy. But basically it's filtering the return signal of the reverb. Okay. So the reverb is going through it, and rather than being a long, expansive reverb, which if you just turn the filter off, it is. It's just a spring reverb. That's all it is, right? And it's a very good spring reverb. So for however much it costs, it's actually a great spring reverb anyway. But once you bring this filter in, you're putting a very savage, very spiky filter onto that reverb signal. Right. So it's a very unique sound. It's not just filtering, you know, it's filtering the return of the reverb. Wow. So you're going synthesizer, whatever, vocal, whatever, into the spring and then affecting the return of the spring. So the spring itself is going wow, wow, or whatever you want it to do. And then you can play the rate. So you right. can be doing things quite musically on the fly where it's like, whoa, 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 on the return. I mean, I'm doing a bad sort of vocalized no, version of it, but right. it's an insane piece of gear. For the first year I had it, I was like, yeah, it's pretty good spring reverb, but the filter's too savage. Then I started putting synths through it, and then I was like, oh, my God. It's like you ignore the synth. Right. You just play a, a note. Yep. You, you're no longer playing the, the filters on the synth. This is your filter section. Amazing. But it's unique because it's going through the springs. So a Boss DM100. Yeah. I, I remember these. I haven't seen one in a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's, I love the Boss stuff because it's gnarly. You know? like it's not high end. It's just crunchy and dark sounding. Um, I like it as a slap delay actually on vocals. Sometimes I'll put it up, I'll run it against the tape echo and I'll see which one wins. Um, and the chorus is super cool too. But it's, um, it's definitely a lo-fi box. I think of it as lo-fi, but so much of the stuff I'm doing, I'm trying to make sound lo-fi anyway. Rather than using a plug-in, you just go straight to that guy. Lovely. And then is this, was this, have you had this for years or is this a... No, I got it when I moved to LA. Um, I was over at Tony Berg's studio. Um, Tony's uh, sort of industry legend over here, great producer, a and man, and he had that sitting there and I was drawn to it immediately and he said, look, if you're going to buy one piece of gear, get this thing, you know. He spoke very highly of it. It's a CR4. It's a four-track cassette recorder, so you can just do four-track recordings on it, which sounds, you know, cool, but really the magic happens over here. It's got all this um, amp modeling and effects and they're actually sick and you can just run... Amp a modeling. A guitar, vocals, anything, and you, you know, and you know, you got new metal, spelt N U. <laughs> <laughs> you know, UK eighties. You know, like whatever. Like they just sound sick. Like these are awesome amp models. There's like an AC thirty. I don't thing. know this Rems. I don't, that's maybe the technology that they were using at the time. It's very nineties. Korg. It's a Korg. It's Korg. So it's, a, it's probably the last bastion of four track cassettes. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, oh, it's, it's right very nineties. It was super cheap, but they're expensive now because a few people have been uh, using them, uh, especially around LA. They've become a bit of a thing. But it's the speakers sound great too. You can actually do a little mix on this, and sometimes I'll print like a little four-track mix back into my session and use it as an intro or something. But just for tracking guitars and the, the effects are sick. Like the rotary, it's like you've got a Leslie in here. The flanger is awesome, and it's just got like what? 12 effects. And you yeah. just put it into record and come out the back of it? Exactly, yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, and you know, when you put the when you select the channel and put the effect on it, and if you're recording it, it commits it to the tape. Right. So you're tracking through the effects on the tape and then you can bounce it back in off tape and it's got that tapey, warbly kind of sound. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it's a good unit. It's good. Some Shadow Hills. Yes. This is um kind of the brains. I, I like to describe this as almost like the center section of a console. Because, you know, it has dim, it's got mono and stereo for monitoring. 
Um, it's got three speakers to select, you know, three outputs for speakers. So I just used the two for my speakers. Um, this is your master level and it's beautifully made. I mean, it just feels so beautiful. Um, but it also has these two preamps, which I believe are called the golden age preamps or something that they make that they sell as separate units. Oh, I don't know. So if I'm just in monitoring, mode, I'm just working out of Pro Tools or whatever, or Logic, I go to this um, setting here. Door one, two. So that's just listen to out, listening to outputs one and two. Yep. Right. So pretty much in the box, these are just preamps that I can I can plug in direct using D as a DI. I have them on the patch bay as mic pre's. They're very good mic pre's. Very open, very transparent. They are my favorite pre's when I've already got a dirty source. So I've got like a dirty guitar or a dirty bass, and I don't need dirt from the preamp. Mm -hmm. I go to these, and they're just beautiful. It has three output transformers to choose from one has a little bump at like I think it's like 80 Hertz one's like more like 200 and that has a tiny bump at like I don't know 12k or something it's all on the website I don't know what they are exactly but I just go until I feel good whichever one right. um, I find tracking it's almost like a subtle EQ but then you go into mix mode when you flip over here um, you're basically it's got 32 inputs but really 30 of summing because one and two are over here. So it's like 30 inputs of summing. Um, so it's a lot in one box. And wow. the mix then gets, when you're over here, is driven by these, it, by these preamps. So you can hit the mix out of Pro Tools really like light and you can drive it on these preamps. Or you can, you can come out pretty hot and you can knock it back a little bit. And then these- you, Is that how you're mixing, summing it that way? Yeah, 90% of the time I'm going through this. Sometimes in the box wins, you know, it just sounds better. Right. But um, I'll go through that, but I also have all my external stuff for mix on the mix bus here. So this comes up on the patch bay. I, I molt the signal so that I'm able to go, basically, um, it has an external input here which shows up. So I can go... I can set up um, sends in Pro Tools to an output, uh, which gets goes to one and two. So effectively, when I'm in mix down, you go to door one and two, I'm listening to in the box. Mm -hmm. I go here, it's summed, but no outboard. I go here, summed with outboard. And mm -hmm. I can just go on one knob between them. So the mystery of like what's summing doing, I know every time because you can just got it on this one dial. It's really great. Um, but I'll nearly always end up on external. I'm using, I, I always go through these preamps here, um, just on Unity like this in line level. And these- On your bus? On the mix bus, into yep. that, no EQ, never read the EQ. Cause I find that even when the EQ is off and I engage them, I find something happens, I don't like it. So I'll go from that and then I'll, I'll go into the Manly Very Mew um, and that'll, that'll come back and then I can drive into that gear harder using these preamps here. And in that mode, these link as well. See how these yep. are linked? So you can just choose whatever output transformer on the mix bus. Fantastic. Well. It's cool, yeah, it's really, I mean, as soon as I got it, I was mixing I'd love to the, sit and hear those differences. Exactly, I mean, take my word for it, I suppose, that like when I got it, um, before I was just mixing in the box, when I stopped mixing on consoles as much, I was just mixing in the box, and then I got this, and I was like, oh, thank the Lord. It mm. was a big difference. Not the summing as much, just being able to do this. You know, the summing is like, it sometimes wins. Sometimes I find that the crunch of in the box is actually better depending on what the song is. But just the, the way you, you know, even when it's just in one and two, it just sounded better anyway. It made the studio sound better. Now, I see you've got some uh, tape mic pre's there. I also yeah. have the same couple of things. Yeah, so these are Ampex 351s. Um, they were at a studio in Sydney called Festival Studios, which was a classic, built in the uh, late 60s studio. So a lot of Australian classic albums were recorded through these guys. Um, I got them from the mastering engineer who worked there, and he um, kind of just inherited them, I suppose, from the studio when it was shut down. So he had them, they're in perfect condition, and never modded them or anything, and I bought them off him. And this was an interesting case in point for modding old pieces of gear. Mm -hmm. Because when I first had them, they were so aggressive because they're not really built as mic pre's. You know, they're built to drive tape machines. So even on one little click here, there's no out, there was no output um, attenuator. So 
you'd have to put it into something like a distressor or an 1176 and use the 1176 or the distressor as a volume control, mm. not as a compressor, which distressors do beautifully, right? Like you can hit it as hard as you want. You can just knock the signal all the way back. Um, but they were so aggressive. It was only usable on just the rarest occasion. So I thought there's a guy in LA who does a beautiful uh, job, you know, he, he's got this modded kit kind of thing that he designed and basically he turned it into a really heavyweight, usable, awesome tube preamp, both of them, and they're matched as well. They're, they're so identical. We have fixed all the tubes, took out all the um, electronics that w weren't necessary. I mean, in the back of these, they've got like, I don't know, like, like I can't remember how many, it's like eight tubes in each unit or something. Um, so now it's, you've got your input level here, um, you've got phantom there. This is a DI input, which used to be the headphone output. Um, phase, um, uh, minus 20 dB pad, and then you can go to the DI input on this selector here. Um, this is for the meter, because you do tend to hit them hot. They're always pinging. So he's got this like where you can run it at plus eight and then it doesn't hit as hard so you don't break your needle. <laughs> um, or you can turn the meter off if you're really smashing it because it literally is pinging, like it's hitting super hard a lot of the time. Um, so they're just awesome preamps and, you know, they stand up against, you know, V76s now. I mean, they're just awesome. They're so good. Um, Fantastic. But, you know, I'm not going to lie, it's lost some of that craziness. Mm -hmm. So I do miss that a little bit. Maybe I'll get another one one day just for the crazy stuff. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but it was worth it. it was they're great. Now we're moving over to the world of some uh, eclectic bunch of keyboards. Yep. Uh, the Juno 6? The Juno 6 is a total workhorse. I mean, I just start so many productions and songwriting, like whatever. I just often will just start on the Juno 6. I like the 6 because there's no presets. I don't really like presets. I just find that you end up scrolling through and just finding other people's sounds or whatever, or just, you know, I just like to, whatever you see is what you get. Sometimes I'll just sweep everything random to some random spot and just turn it on. The more random, the better. So I love, you know, the Juno 6, the filters are ridiculous. It's a powerful machine. Super, um, they're expensive now. You know, they used to I be know. so cheap. I 6 and the 60s, and don't, don't even think about Jupiter 6s or Jupiter 8s now, yeah. like close to 10 They used grand. to be in thrift stores, like, all the time, <laughs> I remember. Like, and now they're, you know... They're pretty sought after now, I think, you know. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. And the Rhodes. Yeah, I love the Rhodes. I remember buying my first Rhodes for 100 bucks. 100 pounds, I should say. Yeah. I've yeah. been here too long, I just said bucks, 100 was pounds. Was it new or was it just... No, it was used, just, but yeah, that was yeah, yeah, yeah. in like 90, blur, you know, early 90s, sure. nobody cared. Yeah. I've had, it's probably my fourth Rhodes, fifth. This is a story for every one of them. Mm. You know, I found one in a house. Like, you know, you have all these stories. I always had a love affair with the Rhodes. I always preferred them to Whirlies in terms of, I find that a Whirly is instantly, you know what it is, but I find that I can mess with the Rhodes a bit more. I don't know. I just like it. I have a Whirly as well, but I just, I always have had the Rhodes in the studio. I like it. And it also has the cigarette burn from my band when we used to tour with it, <laughs> which is, you know, brings back some affectionate memories. <laughs> uh, Prophet Six. Yeah, I got, that's a more recent acquisition. Um, I like the idea of it because I love the Prophet 5, but, and I think it has a lot of the soul of a Prophet 5, and then it has like all lots of modern stuff as well. So I think it's a very nice complement to the Juno. Um, the filters are so different on these. You know, anyone who uses both will know what I'm talking about. Like the Juno is like you paint with very broad, brush strokes, I find that you can go a little bit more detailed with things here. And it also has a clock where you can just dial in the tempo, which can oh. be a bit frustrating with the Juno where I have to actually send, you know, like a click track to its input to clock it, and which is really clunky, but so awesome. Like, I love doing that. <laughs> to be honest, I use that probably like, you know, 80%. I think my brain looks more. at that and goes, oh, sliders, <laughs> dumb, I can, you know, I, my this just looks a little bit more complicated. It is more That's complicated. That's really all it is for it me. It is actually. And you, you, you know, you start to realize that actually a lot of the magic is on like these two knobs. You know what I mean? Like you can do okay. whatever and then you start messing with it up here on this polymod section. 
don't even understand really what they do, but it just messes with everything. You start to create, um, you know, like ring modulator kind of sounds and really right. interesting, very original sounds. That's what I like. I don't really like dialing in the presets. It's just, I always start in the mode where it's just what you see is what you get. Lovely. Yeah. Um, a Moog? Yep, this is a um, micro Moog. This is like a sort of gnarly version of the mini Moog, but it's nothing, it's not really like a mini Moog. I mean, mini Moog has its own thing, but this is like quite gnarly. It's almost like a sort of 80s version of the mini Moog. Um, it's quite aggressive sounding. It has this ribbon so that you can set that so, you know, you can do like siren kind of effects <laughs> or big drops in a track. There's something about using a finger on that slider that, right. yeah, it's, um, it's great. And you can get some really nice sample and hold like random stuff with this. It's the sample and hold random feature on this is just nuts. Like it's that bubbling random thing where you can use this modulation to, um, to dial it in and it starts being almost like a sort of arpeggiator. So, and it sounds almost like a sort of modular setup mm -hmm. at times. And that's kind of one of the reasons I haven't gone into the modular thing. I know like so many people are getting into that and respect like it's amazing, but I just find that doing it on these, I just find it's like, well, it's quicker and it does what I need to you do. You probably have to really seriously lot. commit in that world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You want to go super deep if you want to say anything original. Exactly. Mm. You know, it's like any world. It's hard to say something unique. Mm. You know, so I focus on what, yeah, what I got. Well, tell me about the Kruma. I know little or nothing about this. Kruma Orchestrator. They made a few different um, keyboards, but this one I fell in love with using it at a studio across town. They're still relatively cheap and sort of not really well known. It's kind of like um, an Arp Selena. But um, it's sort of kookier because it's got that Italian-made kind of cheesiness to it. And um, it's, um, it also has this filter in it. So when you're in the brass mode, this filter is a um, ladder filter, very similar to the one in the Mini Moog. So you can actually get Mini Moog sounds when it's on the brass setting. So you take the strings out, you engage the brass. And you can have the brass on this side or this is kind of split. So you can just make it brass all the way, bring this filter in, and it sounds like a mini mug. It's crazy bottom end, and it's got this amazing filter on it. So um, it's a beautiful string synth. It's a, it's a total string ensemble vibe where you can bring cellos and violins and all that in. But it's also a really funky synth with the brass setting. Mm. But um, for strings, it's, it just never fails. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to go up quite considerably in value. I've never actually seen one. Yeah, they will start, I think, pretty soon. I just got in there, I think, with that one. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, some pedals, uh, guitar and keyboards, presumably. Yes. The Juno and the Prophet. I, most of the time, I'm running mono into the guitar pedals, actually. I, I rarely go for the big, lush, wide pad thing anymore. I'm just trying to find space in mixes a lot of the time. So um, I find that running it mono into the guitar pedals, immediately you're just set apart from what the manufacturer wants you to do, <laughs> which is what you're trying to do most of the time is find a unique voice with these instruments. I so. agree. So I'm looking over here, I see a, a Kent bass. Yep. There's... Um, I wonder if I can reach that. Cause sure, yeah. Excuse me. Just because I have not seen this before. That's a, a Japanese 60s sort of, you know knockabout kind of hollow body thing and uh, it speaks very prominently in a mix. So if you, if you want nice. a bass to really be a lead bass, <laughs> then it's great. But if you want to just do a classic bass line, maybe not so much. You know, I've got all the P basses for that. Um, but love it. It's very spongy. It's wow. so spongy. Yeah. That thing is nuts. But, I love uh, that. That seafoam green one is my latest acquisition. That's a Squire bass from the from Japan from the 80s, or 90s actually, but it's a um, three-quarter P bass. I know, I'm looking at it going, it's small. It's super small, it's really rare, and I saw it in the corner of a rehearsal in a pre-production session for an artist I was working with, and I immediately... It makes me look much taller than I really am. I'm, I'm six and a bit, and now I'm seven and a bit. <laughs> like a little mini bass, Lindy Precision. It's a little mini bass. I, does... I didn't know these even existed. Either did I, and I bought it on the spot because I wanted that. Maybe, I mean, maybe jealous. How much did you pay for it? Uh, like 150 bucks. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. The strings cost more than the bass, I think. But, um, 
Wow. Yeah, it's it's a beauty and it sounds awesome. Squire, yeah. we better we better go on onto eBay before these. Uh... Yeah, and I, I'm a you know I'm a small Jewish man and it makes me look bigger on stage. <laughs> so, yeah. do you do you do you play it live? I have been playing it live. Yeah, this has always been my sort of touring base because it's yep. um, it's a really nice P base and um, it's a Japanese one actually. Great. Uh, but it's a reissue of that the seventies ones that I like and it was just all very easy to tour with. And uh, wonderful. They all just sound quite different. These P bases. I love. I love the color choices. The kind of these, the sort of the cream and the uh, seafoam green. That one was whiter when I bought it. I don't know what happened to it, but you got a Mustang here as well. Yeah, that's one of the newer ones, and it's actually a great recording bass. It's got the split thing, so you can kind of get that tight bridge jazz bass sound with it. So it's really great for the studio. For a new bass, it's so just, you know, it can give you so many tones. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, and then some eclectic things, a 12-string Epiphone. Yeah. It's a relatively small body for a 12-string, and I like how it records. It's got some foam in there because it resonates when I'm mixing. Ah. So I leave that in there so it doesn't resonate. It's nice. It plays well. It plays really well. Yeah. Some twelve strings, as you know, are almost unplayable. That's, that's why I got. I bought it new because I wanted a twelve string that would record well. I'll put your phone yeah. back in. Oh, thank you. Very considerate. <laughs> yeah. I know it's probably going to be a pain otherwise. And then I see you have a Takamine. Yeah, the Takamine is um, what they call a lawsuit, pre-lawsuit Takamine. It was ah. late seventies before Martin sued them, so yes. it has the same. It sounds like a Martin. You know? And it was really cheap. It's sort of a bit more gnarly, which I like. Yeah. I like the cheaper, more gnarly kind of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the 70s and early 80s Japanese guitars. Yeah. Where for that same reason, they were just, all they were doing was reverse engineering Gibsons and Martins. Exactly. And building, you know, really beautifully built guitars well, for a fraction of the cost. The thing and, about Japan is they don't do anything badly. You know, yeah. they take, they give a shit, you know, in terms of their manufacturing and everything else. So, you know, I, I love the Japanese stuff. I also, I also like that sort of utilitarian approach. I, I like the, the idea that they, you know, they're getting people to make music and that's a big deal. If it's, if it means a kid's going to start yes. recording, yes. um, you know, because this, this was a third the price of an equivalent Martin, totally. then I'm, yeah. I'm all about it. You know, I want people to make music. Yeah, absolutely. I remember yeah. what it was like when we were kids, there wasn't that much middle equipment. Mm. It was either really, really bad starter stuff. Right. You know, like so crappy guitars to start mm -hmm. on. And then it was Gibson and uh, Gibson and Fender. Which felt sort of unattainable. Oh yeah, a thousand a pounds for a guitar absolutely. might as well have been a million. Yeah, yeah, no, I was, I was all squire and boss for years. Yeah, 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 yeah. totally. It's just, it's, you know, God, God bless them. Yeah. I mean, that's how people get started. Totally. Now, of course, you can buy. Guitars are five hundred dollars. Mm. You close your eyes, and you're not sure if you're playing a ten thousand dollar instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, because of of course computers now, they can yeah, yeah. match the necks, they can match absolutely. the pickups, they can do. Well, I always have this dilemma in the studio when I'm about to buy some gear. I'm like, well, it's in terms of bang for buck, you're better right. off always. I feel buying instruments because you can buy cheap instruments, which will give you so much love in the studio. Yeah. You'll put them on thirty tracks, but you might buy this esoteric compressor that. You know, it's like it might just sit there on the vocal, but there's other things that could do it. There's plugins. There's all right. that. I always feel so guilty buying a very expensive piece of outboard gear when I'm like, wow, I could buy three bases for this right. and have well, all the tones in the world. It speaks to the choice that you have made. So you value every single choice of outboard that you have bought. Yes, yeah, so I've That's succumbed. Good. I succumb often. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of things. What's this? That thing is, uh, it's like a Helicon um, voice processor thing. You know, they make them as guitar pedals, but this was the one that is supposed to be mounted on a mic stand oh. and used live. So you can do doubling and you can do like those auto-tune effects, all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. And then you can engage, like it's a harmonizer, so you can just engage the harmonies on the fly. It's also a really sophisticated like looper. So you can like do wow. quick loops on the fly and then you can have presets saved. Um, I have it there. Actually, I very rarely use it on vocals, though. I use it for just gnarly shit. Like, I put um, keyboards through it. I put drums through it sometimes, like a mono overhead through that and detune nice. it live. So Wonderful. the drummer can hear 
I like the drummer to hear the effects that I'm recording. I don't like doing it as much in the mix. I like them to hear it so that they can attenuate sure. their playing. So <clears throat> it's cool for that. It's, it's, it's super gnarly though. <laughs> like it's not built to read what a drummer's doing. So mm. you get weird artifacts, but I like that. Uh, yeah, I, again, comes back to the random. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love these. I yeah. wish I had one of these. Um, Full tone tape echo. Yeah, really absolutely fantastic unit. Amazingly engineered piece of gear, yeah. Mm. It's phenomenal. And it sounds very different to other tape echoes. I mean, it's its own thing for sure. Um, it has a lot of power in there because of the tone and the drive knobs, those little black ones there. They give you a lot of different options. So you can drive into it and get a really filthy signal. And when you really get it working on the repeats, um, it doesn't sound like any other echo. The way it repeats on itself and the way you can EQ the repeats. So you can go kick, 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 and then you can be, you can EQ like as you're doing it. So it's very pliable and you just get in there and yeah, you can even go stereo on it. It's got some sort of, sort of stereo-ish features where you can have like, you know, like there's three different settings on the stereo, you two outputs. So you can have like dry in the left and affected in the right. And then, right. you know, there's a few different options for it. Yeah, I love it. I feel like Mark Fuller, there was a period where he, he was he was the guy. Everything he did, the pedals. Yeah. I remember the full tone, like the, the um, which distortion I have. I can't remember the, one of the original ones I had. There was mm -hmm. the blues driver, wasn't there? Yeah. And there was one other that was just absolutely phenomenal. The o OCD? Yeah. Yeah, and there's Just the unbelievable. Yeah, stuff. the blue drive stuff is like so many guitarists say, look, if you're gonna get one drive pedal, that's the one. And and the tremolo is always really highly regarded. So what do you got hanging out over here? What um, is this hiding under? Oh, this is. <laughs> look at that. This is a classic little uh, Casio unit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember the VL tone, which was even smaller. Yeah, I mean, this one's fine. It's not like the best, like there are better actual Casio keyboards, which are a bit more legit, like you can get like, but you know, it does have a few sounds in it, which are cool. And again, it's like, I never like plug it in or anything. Like you just get it up to the mic in the middle of a session and just do a bit of this. And it's yeah. just crazy, you know, yeah. just random shit, you know. I when could just think of the VL tone, the, the tune. <laughs> right, right. Well, this has the cards, I'm sure you does could, it? you know, you can get. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I haven't investigated the self-play stuff, but... Oh, uh, it's just yeah. if you turn it on and it had a demo and you'd play it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it did have that. <laughs> I think it's running out of batteries. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds kind of awesome. There you go. <laughs> yeah. God bless it. <laughs> And what's, what's hiding over here? What, what are these two things here? Uh, this is my favorite, actually. This is um, called the Pocket Piano, made by, um, what are they called? I always Mr. Pocket? Critter and Guitari. <laughs> I always <laughs> call it Guitar and Critty, but it's actually Critter and Guitari. Critty and Guitari. And um, it's just a really kind of powerful synthesizer, really. I think it's also running out of batteries, actually. But um, yeah, it's out of batteries. Yeah. So yeah, it's out of batteries actually. I should have got that sorted before this interview, but it's an amazing um, synthesizer, really powerful. Um, and then it has, for each sound that you scroll through here, it's got different parameters. So this is gonna be your volume and then it's got like rate of, you know, and it's, it says it all back here, like what each thing is. So one's a depth, one's a rate envelope, different waveforms, and you can, it's also got arpeggiators in it. This is often when I'm starting to write a song, this is the first thing I'll have through the guitar pedals with a delay, woo, until something emerges. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the wooden buttons, the, nothing's really marked, it's just a blank slate, but it always sounds Helps with incredible. the random, with the happy I mean, accidents. It, it, the way it just sounded was it dying, yeah. but when it's alive, <laughs> it sounds unbelievably good. Is that a, a vibra slap kind of? This thing a... is a very simple unit, um, one of the beautiful things oh, about so being in LA is yeah. that you meet incredible people. I met Money Mark from the Beastie Boys who yeah. had one of these and he told me about it. Basically, you can put any signal through it. Yeah. All it does is cut the signal when you engage this, like an uh, old telegraph. So you can play it. So you're playing the signal. So you could put white noise through it or something. It's like, uh, 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 like that. But it, right. it actually ends up sounding like you're scratching a record or something. It's really cool, but it's a very broad, you're painting very broadly, but then you can put that through delays and then you could play the, into the delay. There's different functions mm. for it, but essentially it's just a clean cut. 
but as clean as and as sudden as you can possibly imagine. I mean, it's just like, what? <laughs> that sounds so much fun. I rarely use it, but when I do... And you can be a telegraph knows. operator with it exactly. as well. It's very Luddite, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go and look at the, the live room here. Yeah, this is... Um, it's a, it's a booth, really, isn't it? I mean, it's a very boothy drum sound in here, but and when I moved in, I never anticipated to, I'd be recording drums in here. I thought maybe just for some demos, and I've done so many drums in here. Um, it actually sounds wonderful. This shitty old little kit that I stole off my son when he lost <laughs> interest in playing drums. Uh, it's an old 60s Japanese kit. Um, it sounds so good, and some of the greatest drummers in LA have come in here and played it and been like, whoa, it's crazy. You just dial in. That's a, one of the benefits of having your own room is you dial the room. You know, you, sure. you get the right instrument for the room. You just leave it, and it's so cool. And you can pretty much get any sound you want out of this little what, situation. What do you got? Is this an Altec gun here? Or is it like yeah, a, that's an Altec salt shaker. It is a salt shaker. Yeah. I've never seen one blue. No, it's been spray painted by ah. a tech who restored it, and he decided to make it like a sort of, you know, 60s blue. It actually, ah. I don't usually like that kind of stuff, to be honest. I'm a bit of a, you know, purist, but... That one actually looks quite nice. And so that's I, interesting to put on the kick. How are you getting the low end back in? Because the thing about the salt shaker is it was real mid range. Yeah, there's no bottom end in it. Yeah. So the Stones used to use that as a kick in. Right. Uh, so it's got a real Stonesy kind of sound where you get yep. that, like you, you actually really hear the kick drum. You don't just hear this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's kind of ironic, right? Because it doesn't have bottom end, but that's exactly the point is that it's giving you the tone of the drum, which hasn't, isn't really in that 100 hertz and below. Sure. It's actually in that lower mid range that you right. want to hear the tone of the drum and that's what that gives you. And I combined that in here. With the Yamaha sub with kick. With the Yamaha sub kick. And the Yamaha sub kick, I find, I've had better results with that than the NS10, just the rewired speakers, which sound awesome. Sure. But I just find that that has a bit more tone in it. I'm not sure why. It's just the way it's mounted. So I, I love this idea. So it's a little bit like actually some of the things I subscribe to when mixing is like with multiple mics on a kick drum, it's just like use just one mic for one service rather than blend all three at the same and then try They're and... complementary. Yeah. So I love this. Very often you'll see, you know, like a uh, FET 47 and a D12. And I'm like, oh... You only want one of those yeah, I think a D12 situations, is, right? Yeah, so I, I, this yeah. is absolutely complementary. They go Fantastic. together. And depending on what you want to do in the mix, like not just the drum sound, but in the mix, how mm. where do you want to place that kick drum? You can just dial in that. I want to hear this. Altec. Oh, it's, it's great. I want to it's hear a this. good one. So the C12A you've got here, is this yeah. typical where you're putting it? So like an overall view it of is the kick? actually. Kit? I would sometimes... Depending if the drummer's not too much of a hard hitter and a good player, I can get it right down there, yeah. right on top looking at the pedal. Yeah. And that's 80% of the drum sound right there. Wow. It's, it's a whole drum sound right there because it balances the kick drum with the snare perfectly um, and the cymbals kind of creep, creep in. Not for like a very modern big, you know, like, you know, rock sound. I'm not saying, I mean, you wouldn't do that in this room anyway, right? Sure. But for this tight booth sound, you can get, most of the sound out of this one mic, and then you can get the stereo field from the close mics. So mm. you get the stereo sound from, you know, the panning of the toms because it's that dry sound. Mm. But if you're looking for that open roomy sound, this isn't really the room for it anyway. Oh, so I, I'm really, when you're talking about this mic philosophy, I'm talking about a close mic boothy sound, right. which honestly, like so many of the records I'm doing these days, that's where I'm going anyway. And I find right. that that's kind of like, you know, people love it. I've always loved it. I've always loved it. And I happen to be friends with a few drummers here who almost helped to find that sound. You know, Joey Warrenka in particular, he comes in here a lot and plays this kit. Wow. And loves it. You know, it just we just have so much fun. I love the tambourine over the top. That's like a sort of uh, a hand drum. Yeah, it's the worst sounding floor tom in existence <laughs> on its own and then so you put this hand drum over I the top stole that from my son's school i didn't steal it they gave it to me they said i could i thought it had some bells in my mistake i was over at my son's school and they had a bunch of those in the music room oh, that's amazing. yeah <laughs> that's great it's super tight but perfect for this yeah they're both set up as concert toms um they, they don't have bottom heads on them Oh, that snare's nice. Is that uh, Acrylite? It's an Acrylite. Sounds so deep. Yeah, yeah, it has one of these things on it called Big Fat Snare Drum. Uh, I don't know that. Discovered that recently. Highly recommend it. Um, 
they, they, it's like an O-ring, but it's specifically designed so that you don't have to do any work. Because even with O-rings, I find sometimes getting that fat sound, you still have to tune the drum a lot. Yeah. This, you literally put it on any shitty snare and it just gives you that big, fat, low sound, dry, wide, wow. long note thing. Is that a contact mic you've got on there as well? That is, yeah. What do you use? It's this guy here, this Cortado made by Zeppelin Labs. Love um, it. It's a very good contact mic. A lot of contact mics for me just sound like, like a, like a little puff. They don't have a sound. They don't right. really have an aesthetic. This one is f it's just I love intense. This. Yeah, that combined with, to be honest, I actually don't usually have a fifty-seven in here. On that was here because I was recording some piano with those. But I usually have a Soyuz on this. All right, we do. We love the Soyuz. I find uh, I recently got those and. Super Honestly, wet. it's the best snare mic I've ever used. Snare up. It's Are you bottom micing the snare? Not in here, but in other studios, yes. What are you using for overheads? Anything? Uh, yeah, I'll put the... Uh, this is an interesting mic. I mean, I'll, I'll either use the 4038 if I want a more sort of old school ribbon sound, or I'll go the... Coles, um, yes. Yeah, Coles. Yep. Or the 47. But this 47 is made by a guy called Gunter Wagner in uh, Australia, he's uh, originally German, Gunter Wagner. Uh, he, uh, I think he used to work for Neumann and um, he has a lot of contacts in the world of Neumann and he's got a pretty unique access to a lot of the uh, new old stock parts from the mics. Oh. And he developed a way, he was servicing U47s for many years, and he built this um, the new capsule that's in a lot of old U47s you see around. Once they lose their capsules, he made a very good replacement. And then he said, well, I've done the capsule. I may as well make the mic. So he made his own version of a 47. It used an EF14 tube, not the uh, VF14. And he worked out some way to regulate it that it sounds like a 47 and operates like a 47. Other than the tube, every part is, you could literally take it off that mic and put it on a vintage 47. So it's not really a clone as such, he calls it a remake. Because a lot of clones will make other decisions to make them cheaper, but it costs as much as a 47 and it, uh, it's, I could take the whole headstock off and put it on a vintage one. How much was it? They're, well, they don't, you can't get them anymore, so I don't know what they're worth now. <laughs> right. But uh, he only made 280, I think, of them. That's like 227 or something of 280. And uh, he couldn't get any more of what he calls Zim materials. Right. So, he won't make the new old stock parts he can't get, so they're done. They're done. Yeah. But what did you pay for it? Damn, it's good. It's 10 grand. Right, so it's, cl it's getting close to, to, a, yeah, to a 47. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and it's, it's just been a complete workhorse. I mean, in saying that, you don't need a 10 grand mic to make great music, like whatever. No, I understand. But I will say that it uh, makes my job easier every day in the sense that I just put it up and boom. It's just... Magnificent. Beautiful. Yeah. So you've got the Soyuz on the piano at the moment. Yes. Oh, but we didn't get into, so overhead, so this would be a mono overhead then as well. Yeah, and you know what I do sometimes? It's breaking a few rules, but I'll, break, uh, break them. I'll often use mismatched stereo overheads. I'll put like, uh, you know, the 4038 up with the 47 or the 47 and 87 or whatever. I don't have stereo mics except for the Soyuz. Um, so it's been almost out of necessity, but necessity being the mother of invention, I've ended up with some of the craziest drum sounds doing that. Um, right. And it breaks some of the rules of that true stereo, but I'm often not really using it for true stereo. I'm using it to speak and to get some kind of character out of the drums. And so often um, I'm doing that and then running it through the modular channel for some crazy sound, and then I'll use the close mics. Um, for the, the real stereo field stuff in terms of the pan of like when you go for a fill, which is when you want to hear those stereo drums, it's like boom, boom, boom across the mix. <coughs> the key for that for me is always the player. Because sure. a great drummer is going to make one mic sound ridiculous. Right. And people are always asking, oh, how'd you get that drum sound? Well, like, Joey's well, an amazing drummer, yes. Yeah, it's like one mic with a great drummer. Yeah. You know. It's definitely all about balance, isn't it? You, you get yeah. a guy who, or a girl who's smashing the cymbals. Yeah. There's not much you can do. If and of course, is. when you're working with bands, you, you can't always pick your drummer, and that's fine. And it's a bit more of a struggle on the engineering front. But then I'll more typically go a bit more classic engineering. I'll go like properly matched. I'll measure the overheads with the snare. I'll do all of that stuff yeah. in another studio, you know, when I'm tracking a band. I find myself taking like 
paper towel, putting under symbols and taping it, sometimes yeah. without even the drummer knowing, sure, yeah, just yeah. to get rid of some yeah. of that harshness if they're Yeah, I've gotten into in trouble, yeah, for moving china and splash symbols away from kits. You know, I'd probably take the China print in the next yeah, room, that's but that's what I was trying me. to do. Yeah, but, <laughs> I was like, I, successfully. I always made that joke. It's like yeah. we could take the dustbin lid from out there and use that instead. Sorry, China symbol. Yeah, purple. I apologize. Too, I just started you know a they whole can war, a whole war cool. of China symbols. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was the '90s, wasn't it? Late '90s rock. You always had that. Kush, 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 kush. Yeah. And you're like, what is that sound? Yeah. Oh, it's China. Yeah. So this is. Um, I, I, I love people that I relate to the idea of the crappy piano, and I mean that in a loving sense, the, yeah. the piano that's just your oh, sound yeah. that nobody else has. Absolutely. Now, of course, it's going to sound like a Steinway, but I mean, you know no, what I mean. it doesn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's It's janky. Character. It's full of character, this yeah. thing. And um, I've had many over the years, mm -hmm. and each one gives something different. And it certainly isn't one of those situations where you want to have the a broad, open, balanced piano that'll be good on all genres. No, I just go for character. I'm yeah. cool with it. And if I get tired of it, I'll send it out and get another one because people are giving them away, right? It's like people actually pay you to move pianos out of yeah. their houses now. Um, but the amount of times a musician has walked in or a songwriter and been like, oh, and they sit at it and boom, we're done, we're away. You know, it gives so much love. And to be honest, this one, it's given more than I thought it would. It records very well. I've found that recording it down there underneath is its got a nice love. It does, and yeah. it's quite punchy as well and bright. I had this um this felt built for it as well, where you just simply go like this, because it didn't come with a felt. Oh wow. And there you go, you sort of got, you know. Oh, it's gorgeous. It just do, do that again without you know. me talking. Yeah. I love that. It sounds like you're upstairs and somebody's playing piano downstairs. Yeah, and typically and I'm playing it a bit loud so you can hear it, but when you're recording, you can gain up the mics. You play very softly and it's right in, right in your ear holes. You know, you get that nice proximity effect. Yeah, I mean, a, a piano, you know, you really should, you can do anything, really, by treating it. So there's some fun stuff on the walls. Uh, I'm a huge Starfire fan, so seeing this here is just makes makes my uh, yeah. warm and fuzzy. Uh, one of my first real guitars was a 62 Starfire, so I love Starfire. Oh, they're so awesome. It's, I, I describe it as like a gnarly 335, you know, like it's, you know, you can play like really refined audiophile jazz on it if you want to, mm -hmm. but it can just get so gnarly if you want it to as well. And I love this knob here that you can get your tone and then just wind it back or, you know, this is like a master volume, you know. Beautiful. Yeah, it's great. And then what's this, an LG? LG1, LG1. 1962, uh, I think it was 61 or 62. Okay. Uh, it's small body acoustic. It, just wins all the time. It's a bitch to play. Oh, it is? I put really heavy gauge strings on it, but it sounds awesome. It's a beautiful little neck on it, though. I mean, it just speaks in a mix, like. Crazy. Yeah, it's got that mid range poke. Oh, yeah, big time. A little nose. Not a great strummer. If you want that open strumming thing, no. But <laughs> yeah, it's understand. boxy. Yep. But for finger picky stuff, yeah. Gorgeous. It's, it's and the Hofner? Yeah, the Hof is like, I've had that forever. It's 1965. What can I say? I mean, you know, it just, it just wins all the time. It's Lovely. the best. They're, they're so good. So um, in our Beatles sort of moment, we're going down to an AC30. Yeah. Is it an AC30? It's an AC15, hand wired 15. one. Oh, these are cool. I didn't, like, I didn't know this model. Yeah, is, they're as kind big of new. That. They're newish and. Um, I don't know when they started making them, but um, it's not like a vintage amp or anything, but it, it's really great for recording because it has this thing where you can push it down to 7.5 watts. Yeah. And you can, so you can get that super dirty sound, but at very low volumes. So it's already like a 15 watt amp, but you can go 7.5 and then you drive it. Lovely. Them and it's awesome. And it has so many tone options. It's crazy. It's got... Um, so you got like this bright switch, which just, you know, creates a completely different sound right at the outset. 
or you can go over to this input and then you've got your you know treble and bass but then you've got hot and cool and the two stages give completely different like the hot is just like really gnarly and bitey that classic ac30 thing cool is where you want to get more of a cleaner sound but it's still pretty gritty wonderful and you can also engage this this master volume as at the output stage. So you can do all sorts of gnarly stuff here and bring the volume right back here. I sort of want to come back and it. play around with that. Yeah, <laughs> tone cuts cool as classic. Yeah. Look, I, I'm super excited by this. Who was talking about this? Was this Bradley? Bradley? This was on the Foo Fighters record, yeah? What were they using it for? As a, he was making like the hallway leading into the drum room. The shotgun? We, yeah, that. Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. And we, we, we spent ages trying to find one online, and right. you have one. <laughs> I had two, and I, and I gave one to Joey, and he's, he uses it as a room mic in his studio. And, and I actually, I really like this. It, it goes on the kick in sometimes instead of the Altec. It Interesting. It gives a very, as you can imagine, a proximity effect to your mm -hmm. ear for the kick drum, almost fake. It's almost like a contact mic. Wow. Uh, and it's just this, you know, and it's right up. So again, when you complement it with the sub kick, it can be a really cool drum sound. The K. I love this amp. I remember, yeah. oh, I love hearing the frame. Do you ever mic the frame? I do all the time. That's and amazing. This what? kick drum, there's a reason why the drums sound good in here. Yeah. It's the piano. Uh, the sympathetic resonance really expands the length of the sound. Uh, that's rather nice. I do have a big blanket out there that I can... Shut it down if I need to, but I, I always leave it open. Even if it's just the sympathetic resonance coming back this way on the close mics, you don't really hear it, but mm. you take it out, you notice. There was a studio, it's over three years ago now, there was a studio, uh, Dave Cobb used to have it upstairs and downstairs there was a room, it was next to, I think it was called Hollywood Sound. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of that one? They used to have a grand piano in there and it was the weirdest sort of ugly shaped live room with a big yeah. post in the middle. Yeah. So you'd walk in there and go, ooh. But they had this grand piano and they'd open up, put mics on the strings oh, wow, yeah, and cool. you'd record drums and it yeah. was It's amazing. insane with the drums, yeah. Kick yeah. drum in particular. It's nuts what it does. Yeah, it was yeah. like a great selling point on a random room. Yeah, your room. brain doesn't hear it after, you hear it twice and you don't hear it anymore. You just hear the, the richness of the harmonics, that's it. Great. Yeah. So I got all excited because I used one of these amps, um, I have a silly story, really quick, I used one of these exact, as far as I know, the same model, it looks identical, unless they made many that look the same, mm. used it on a second Frey record, and we had the best guitar sound ever, like, um, for a brief moment, mm. and then it fried, and I think what it was, it was dying, Yes. and as it was dying, it was getting more and more, yeah, yeah, like, distorted yeah, yeah. and crazy. Totally, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, awesome. So the I have a very a fond out. memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the dying K, the famous dying K sound. It's yeah, I love that thing. It's great. It's like you know one sound. Yeah. It's one sound, but you it's just like turn a little, it on it's like a little it piece of furniture, isn't it? It's, it's beautiful. Like, yeah, I mean, sitting on top of the Vox, it looks lovely. It's like a sort of yeah. bit of brown furniture from the seventies. But we can't like we were talking about like emotional responses to stuff, things being tactile and mm. co consoles and things like that. There is something to be said for you know pieces of equipment, amps, guitars, or whatever that just are also nice pieces of furniture to have around. You want to pick them up oh, and yeah. play them because they look beautiful. Yeah, there's nothing like a room full of old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> That's beginning to be me. Okay, so <laughs> so the Yell Reverb, I don't know the sound at all. Yeah, probably for a good reason. I mean, they're pretty shitty. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I picked it up when I was a kid. It was my first Fender amp, and it's one of those things like, I probably almost sold it hundreds of times and never did. And I'm really glad because now it actually sounds super gnarly. Like it almost, I don't know, like the sound of driving transistor amps is a sound. You know, Absolutely. it's really like, you know, everyone always talks about tube amps and they do like respond better or whatever. But man, like you drive a transistor amp, it can sound super gnarly. And what I really like about this one is the spring reverb in it. And I actually use it a lot for putting out in the hallway here, uh, and I'll use it to create a chamber reverb in the hallway. Mm. But I use that because I run into it, I'll bring the reverb on the amp, which will make the chamber out there sound infinitely bigger because you're sending reverb into reverb. And um, that's nice. cool. That's, it's cool for that, yeah. It's funny, we have a, just a top and tail, my, my freak conversation I did the same thing with a, a, a deluxe being fed by an electro harmonics um, holy grail Sweet. and then mic'd up the room 
Yeah. So awesome. yeah, I understand the reverb into the reverb into, into the, the reverbs. Yeah. Right. I mean, I love sending reverbs. Yeah, into the spring reverbs. You know, I'll put a reverb on the pedal too, on the pedal board. Nice. Into that, beautiful. And last but no means least, we have your massive acoustic stack. I actually yeah. am twenty-two foot tall, and this no, um, this is pretty crazy. So do you? Yeah. Do you record bass with this? Sometimes. I use the Sans amp actually a lot for recording bass um, these days. <clears throat> I get good results with it and I split it out so I have a clean signal and the Sans amp. And between that, usually I'm pretty good. Um, this must be nice though if you've got like the band in here, everybody's jamming exactly, and trying if, ideas. Exactly. It's great for just trying ideas, rehearsing. I take it for rehearsals as well. It's a super cute little amp. It's it's not like the best amp you know, I've ever had like... You know, I, if I'm playing live, I like to use Orange Amps or Ampeg, whatever is, you know, it's usually backline when you're playing live anyway. But um, but it's super cute and it's really mid-range forward. So for the Hofner in particular, it's just like you just get all of that mid-range stuff. It's awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for showing us around. I really Thanks, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to come back and hear some stuff. I'm particularly interested in hearing this drum sound. Oh yeah, totally. I'll send you some. Uh, I'll send you some takes. Send me some stuff. Thank you ever so much. Awesome. Thanks, Warren. Please leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below. Um, we're going to link to whatever sites you've got and all of our good stuff. Awesome. And uh, have a marvelous time recording and mixing. <laughs>